Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. Happy New Year. It's good to see everybody again. It's good to see you earlier this week or last week as well. Um, we are assembled electronically today for the purposes of uh, inviting public comment on legislation that's pending before us. Um, but before we get started, uh, we will begin with committee introductions, uh, starting with the House Chairman. Sorry, can, can you hear me? Okay, so we'll begin. Uh, Chairman Chiazzo, you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chris Chiazzo, House District 128, representing uh, beautiful West Scarborough, and uh, good to see everybody's faces again. Okay, uh, Representative Corey. Good morning, I'm Patrick Corey, represent House District 25, which is part of Wyndham. Hey, Representative Supika. Good morning, I am Representative Laura Supika, a House District 126 or uh, 22, one or the other right now. Um, <laughs> and uh, I represent a portion of Bangor, and it's good to see all your faces again. Great, Representative Kinney. Good morning. I'm Representative Mary Ann Kinney. I represent House District 99, and that's nine towns in Western Waldo County. And it is great to be back. Okay, Representative McCrate. So thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> it's good to be back. And I notice Representative Kinney has a different bird behind her this time. Um, I represent Harpswell West Bath and Northeast Brunswick in the House. Uh, Representative Wood. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Barb Wood, and I represent District 38, which is in Portland, the West End, and the St. John Valley area. Hey, Representative Riley. Good morning, and <clears throat> welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm Representative Riley of House District 34, which is part of Westbrook. Great, and I think that's all we have with the screens on. Um, with us today also, we have our uh, committee clerk, Karen Montel, and we have our committee analyst uh, for the first couple of bills with Sam Prower. And we have Janet Stoko. I don't know if she's on yet, who, who will be in for the other bills as well. Oh. <laughs> Great, and all right, before we get started, we'll just go over a few of the um, kind of ground rules for, for a virtual public hearing again, since it's been a while since we've done it. Um, so this meeting, as you all know, is currently being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel. This means that anyone who's a participant in the meetings today via Zoom uh, can be seen and also heard if their microphone is unmuted. Uh, people on the Zoom meeting waiting to testify today uh, can't be seen or heard until they're called upon to speak. And it's important to note that as we um, call you into the meeting and bring you into the panel, it may look like you're being dropped for a second as we bring you up. But once here, uh, you'll have the chance to unmute yourself and turn your camera on and deliver your testimony. Um, as usual, the audio for this meeting is being live streamed online at the legislature's website. And if you've submitted written testimony, it will be publicly posted on the legislature's website as well. Uh, regarding the chat function of the Zoom meeting, this is for uh, technical assistance only. It's not a place to conduct any substantive work as it's not publicly available. And a uh, general reminder to everybody, this is a public hearing. It's our chance to hear from the public on the, on the legislation that's pending before us. If any committee members uh, would like to ask a question of people who are testifying today, please raise your virtual hand uh, and then we'll call on you um, as we go. So for our bills today, we'll begin uh, with the sponsors followed by those uh, co-sponsors and then those who've registered to testify today. And we'll do the best of our ability to move through the testimony uh, by those beginning with those who wish to speak in favor followed by those in opposition. And lastly, uh, for those who are neither for nor against. 
uh, for members of the public, uh, when you're called upon, please state your name, your place of residence, and the organization you represent, if any. Only remarks on the legislation before us are considered in order, and anything else is considered out of order. And also a reminder to members of the public who are here to testify that testimony is limited to three minutes. So please tailor your remarks accordingly. Once we get to three minutes, um, the house chairman will cut in. So uh, with that, I think I will turn it over to house chairman Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome back everybody. Um, uh, I'd like to start kicking off um, our, our session here with public hearing for LD 1743, which is uh, an act to amend certain definitions in the statutes governing the Gambling Control Board. And at this time, I will recognize the bill sponsor, Senator Lucchini. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so we've got a couple of department bills this morning that have come from the uh, Gambling Control Board. So, uh, Chairman Chiazzo, members of the committee, my name is Louis Lucchini. I represent most of Hancock County in the State Senate. I think I forgot to introduce myself earlier anyway. <laughs> and I'm here to present LD 1743, an act to amend certain definitions in the statutes governing the Gambling Control Board. Uh, so, as, as it says on the bill, this is a department bill uh, that they brought in, and really it is a tweak to the definition of electronic table game from that electronic facsimile um, across the uh, gambling statutes. So it looks like a fairly simple change being proposed by the Gambling Control Board. And I think if Director Champion is in attendance, he'll be able to elaborate on, on why this is necessary. So with that, I'll conclude and uh, answer any questions. Okay, any questions for Senator Lucchini? All right, seeing none, thank you, Senator, for kicking us off. Uh, I don't see any, there are no other co-sponsors for this legislation, so we will go to uh, those in favor. Uh, let's see, Director Champion is here, he is in the room. So Director Champion, when you are ready, we will hear your testimony, sir. Okay, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, Senator Lucchini, Representative Giazzo, and distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. I am Milton Champion, Executive Director of the Gambling Control Unit within the Department of Public Safety. And I'm here today on behalf of the Department of Public Safety to testify in favor of LD 1743, which is an act to amend certain definitions in the statutes governing the Gambling Control Board specifically removing electronic fast meal from the definitions in Title VIII, subsec or subsection 1001, sub uh, 13A, uh, removing or taking to electronic table or introducing electronic table game or removing the reference to an electronic fast meal of 43-A, the definition of a table game. This will give the board a clearer understanding between regular table games and those offered electronically especially in the rulemaking process, which we are on, on are underway. Uh, with uh, COVID, uh, this has uh, kind of been uh, uh, a subject matter that we've been working on now for, for about the last year in trying to, to have a clearer understanding of electronic, uh, electronic table games. So both of our casino facilities would like to introduce these devices. And so that's why we need to have this, this definition cleaned up. I thank you for the opportunity to appear this, this morning before the committee. And if you have any other questions or any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Director Champion. Uh, any questions for Director Champion? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't see anybody else on the list that was speaking in favor. So we'll move on. I don't see any uh, opposed either. So we'll move on to neither for nor against. And I will bring in, uh, I don't see Mr. Krawick in the attendee list. So 
Well, let me just bear with me for a second. Obviously, we're <laughs> still working out the kinks a little bit. Aha. All right. Thank you, Janet, for that. Then uh, I don't see anybody else uh, listed to testify. Is there anybody in the attendee list that wishes to testify on LB 1743? If so, please raise your virtual hand and we'll recognize you. Okay, seeing none. Uh, sorry, Representative Wood. <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to get back in the swing of things here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Crowick from Pittston submitted something in writing that I just opened, and I don't know if it's me, but it doesn't appear to be in English. So, Janet? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Janet. So last week when people were signing up to testify, the Zoom links were not being sent out. So LIT did a lot of fake signing up to try and get, test the system. And they were signing up both with and without testimony, but they put in fake testimony. Okay. Like on one committee, their testimony said, this is a dummy PDF. So I don't know why he put in something that we can't read in Latin, but I think it was supposed to signal to us that it's not real. Well, I, I saw the ones that said test. And so that made sense. But anyway, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, they, they, they obviously got me too, Barb. So this is a good way to dust off the cobwebs a little bit, I think so. Um, okay, seeing no further testimony, then uh, we'll close the public hearing for LB 1743. Uh, so uh, this honestly seems pretty straightforward. Um, seems like a, 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 a couple of just minor word changes. So uh, if the committee is willing, I will entertain a motion to move to work session. Represent, uh, sorry, Senator Farron. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we move to work session on LD 1743. Second. Second. Oh. <laughs> All right, so Senator Farron moves to work session, seconded by Representative Riley. Uh, any questions, comments, debates? Okay, uh, then I think we open this for, uh, for a vote. Uh, and I think we could probably just do a show of hands. I don't think we need to do a roll call. So um, all those in favor of moving to work session for 1743, please raise your hand. Uh, sorry, Representative Kinney, did you have a question or are you voting? No, I'll wait for discussion. Okay. <laughs> okay. So all those in favor of going to work session, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, Everybody? seven, Everybody. eight, okay. nine. Uh, I um, see nine to nothing. Karen, all present voting. Riley, Asupika. Oh, sorry. You all set, Karen? Okay. All right, so we'll open up the work session for LD 1743. Uh, start with discussion. Representative Kinney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just reading this over, this is just, it seems like it's the idea of having in the casinos, having a, a game that's electronic, like a having an iPad type of a thing at a table. It's still something that's, physically in the casino, is that a correct understanding of this? Uh, Senator Lachini, either you or Director Champion, if you wanna, if you wanna address that. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think this is just uh, changing the name from electronic facsimile to electronic table game of devices that are already being used um, in the casino. I think it puts it more towards the, I guess the industry standard language, but I think Director Champion would know better than, than I um, exactly why, but I think it's really just a name change. Director Champion. Yes, that is, that is true. Uh, these are uh, electronic table games that are, that are played the same as a regular or a normal live dealer type uh, presented game uh, like craps, roulette, 
Um, some do blackjack, you know, they're, they're all basically, they were introduced so that people that, that normally wouldn't play table games wouldn't be intimidated. So they would learn on these electronic table games and they feel less intimidated by, you know, by having the ability to play these. And naturally there's, there's lesser interaction, uh, you know, physical interaction and stuff. So that's why it's, it's kind of uh, a plus here during the, during the COVID, the COVID situation. So um, it's just electronic fast meal was, was just a little bit off of, uh, wasn't really a clear uh, definition. And so that's why we just wanted to specifically say electronic table game, but these are devices that have to be approved to be able to be played in Maine, which they are, and uh, they have to be uh, approved for shipment and installation and everything, but only the casinos will utilize those. All right. Are you, Representative Kennedy, you, Kenny, do you want a follow up? Are you okay? You good? I'm all set. That was, that was perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? All right. Seeing none. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Sam. I just raised it right after you said that. Um, <laughs> no worries. Um, I just wanted to note for the committee. Um, so obviously I haven't prepared a bill analysis yet for this bill. Um, uh, cause I wasn't aware until right before that, um, voting may happen today. Um, so I will just note for you, um, this, I, Upon review, like it seems like a very simple bill, and if there are any additional concerns that may, you know, uh, be be relevant, I will uh, bring it back to you and uh, let you know um, after, however the vote goes. Yeah, thanks, Sam, and sorry to put you on the spot. We're we're still dusting off the cobweb, so uh, no worries. Try try trying to be uh, as expeditious as usual, uh, and hopefully we don't we don't drop anything on the way. Senator Farron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree. I think this is a pretty straightforward um, bill cleaning up that language. And, and I would be in favor of making a motion ought to pass. But before I do that, I think I'd like to just ask uh, the, both chairs their comfort level. Should we, should we just wait until, I mean, we're meeting on Wednesday and just give um, Sam a chance to to, to look at it and bring something back to us. Uh, I'm all, I'm all about moving forward quickly, um, but, you know, waiting until Wednesday and giving Sam a couple of days just to see if there's something that maybe that might be the most prudent thing to do, but I'm open for the discussion. I'd just like to see what other committee members think. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Yeah. I, I mean, again, I, I don't think it's, it's very controversial, but I agree with 100%. You know, we'd better to take a look at it now and make sure we don't have to come back and revisit it afterwards. Um, so um, uh, if we, if, if we're not, you know, we're not going to move things through now, we certainly can put it, I think, uh, put on a work session for either Wednesday or, or, or in the next following, uh, next couple of meetings or so. Uh, Senator Lukin. You're still muted, sir. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Use my real hand. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm good either way. I think if we wanted to, like uh, as Sam said, if we if we voted it and then if anything happened, if anything gets spotted before the um, language review, we can raise it, raise it then, or in, in like something like a fiscal note or something. Anyway, you'd have to bring back. So whatever the committee's preference is, um, but I'm I'm good to to vote it now if if you want, and then. If anything arises, we can certainly reconsider. We have to keep up with transportation, so. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Farron. Well, so see, this is where we're getting back into the swing of things. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I got to believe that hopefully, you know, we'll set the standard here and we got transportation tomorrow. So Sam, we'll bring that up transportation tomorrow. But I'll make a motion of ought to pass for LD 1743. Second. Senator Farron has moved uh, ought to pass 1743. Is there a second? Representative Corey. No, it's not a second yet. Um, I, 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 I don't think it would be hard to, I, I, I'm okay with, with waiting until Wednesday to vote on it. I think if we go ahead and we vote it and then um, 
you know, it does come forth with a fiscal note or, or something like that. That's one thing. And, you know, taking care of it on language review, but we haven't amended it. So I don't think we would even have language review on this bill, number one. And then number two, if we go ahead and we vote it today, we're not going to get any analysis out of Sam anyways, unless we request that of him. So I think that the two things that we're saying would occur if we vote it today, just probably will not will not happen unless of course there's a fiscal note maybe then there would be some language review but i i don't think language review or or um or um that analysis will happen if we vote today thanks thank you representative corey representative mccree thanks mr chair um <clears throat> i had raised my hand to second but a question for sam wouldn't we have a language review either way um, so yeah, I guess, yes, I, I will, um, even if there was no fiscal impact, um, when I put in the fiscal note request, I'll still bring that back to let you know that there was no fiscal impact. Um, and then, you know, I'm open to however you want to proceed. I'm not pushing one way or another. Um, we sometimes have proceeded this way in transportation before. Um, and I, I guess my note at the beginning was, was, kind of in the spirit of how we've done that, which is um, we always do a uh, legal review in the office, regardless if you do straight out the pass or not. Um, and um, I view it as my responsibility to, to note anything that uh, may be a concern for you. So um, if you want, you can vote today and I will bring, and I will bring back any concerns for you if you want to recon and then you can reconsider the vote um, or you can wait um, and I can put together a formal bill analysis and you can uh, vote at a later day. It, it um, doesn't make a difference to me. It's really about what you're comfortable with and um, just know that either way I will flag problems that may come up. So whatever you prefer. Thank you, Sam. Uh, uh, well, well noted for sure. Sorry, I'll take myself off mute now. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. Uh, well, well noted, Chair. Uh, Senator Lucchini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to, to be clear, no matter what, whenever we vote, even if it's not to pass, straight out to pass, it comes back to us before we report it out. We'll have an opportunity <laughs> when we're told that it's going to be passed as a straight out to pass and that there's no fiscal note. So the committee will have time to look at it again, at which point Sam could bring it back. I mean, it's fairly standard to do a straight to work session bill like this. Thank you, Senator Lucchini. Uh, Senator Farron? No, I was just gonna reiterate what uh, Senator Lucchini just said. I, I, I heard very clear Sam that he was still gonna do that and come back to us with any issue. So I do not share the same concerns that uh, Representative Corey had on this. And I think I have motion on the, on the table right now of ought to pass. Representative Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just prefer to vote once rather than, you know, potentially vote after a language review or after we've already voted. So I'd rather, I'd rather vote once. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Corey. I mean, I think from a, from a scheduling standpoint, um, you know, again, we're going to have plenty of opportunities to vote bills. <laughs> we're going to have a lot of stuff to discuss. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate the fact that, you know, we'll, we'll still have eyes on it. We still have to approve it, you know, before it hits the, uh, hits the floors and, and leaves the committee anyway. So um, I, I certainly don't, I, I mean, I understand where you're coming from, Representative Corey, and, and, and I, I get that. Um, I, I wouldn't have any concerns with voting it through because we're not, we will get another chance to look at it if necessary. Representative McCray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move to second um, Senator Farron's motion. Okay, thank you. So um, the motion is ought to pass, uh, made by Senator Farron, seconded by Representative McCrate. And Karen, if you could call our first roll of the second session, I would appreciate it. I'd be happy to. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Senator Hickman, absent. Senator Farron. 
Yay. Senator Farron. Yay. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative Tuttle. Representative Tuttle. Absent. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington. Absent. Representative Corey. No. Representative Corey. No. Representative Dalla. Representative Dalla. Absent. Mr. Chair, uh, eight voted in favor of the motion, one voted against the motion, and four members are absent. All right, thank you, Karen. Uh, Representative Corey, do you have a, uh, uh, a separate report? What, what, what is your separate report gonna be? Oh, not to pass. Minority report is on not to pass, okay. Sam, let me know when you're ready, if we're, if we're good to move on. They're all set, I got it. All right, thank you, sir. So the motion passes uh, eight to one to four, uh, and we will uh, bring that back to look at, um, uh, if necessary, from uh, when we do language review. Okay, I probably should have said this ahead of time, so I apologize, I'm kind of dusting things off a little bit. Um, the order that we're gonna take these bills in, um, is obviously 1743 we did first. We're gonna do 1745 uh, next. Uh, then we will move into uh, the uh, liquor bills and we will do, well, we'll go in, in the order of 1750 first, then 1751 and finally 1643. So having said that, we will now open the public hearing for LD 1745. Bear with me for a second while I bring up the other screens, which is an act to amend the laws governing the Gambling Control Board. And I will recognize the bill sponsor, Senator Lucchini. Thank you, uh, Representative Chiazzo, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Louis Lucchini. I represent most of Hancock County in the Senate. <clears throat> And I'm here to present LD 1745, an act to amend the laws governing the Gambling Control Board. Um, again, as the bill uh, jacket says, this was submitted by the uh, Department of Public Safety um, as a department bill for the Gambling Control Board. I think this is another simple change to the Gambling Control Board statutes. And under this, it would add a three-year option for employee licensing. Uh, I'm sure Director Champion can explain the rationale for this. Uh, again, I, um, I think as we worked previously, rather than renewing licenses every year, it, it uh, saves some administrative work on the gambling control board side and also reduces paperwork for the employees who have to file it every year. So with that, I'll conclude and take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Senator Lucchini. Any questions for the Senator? Okay, seeing none, uh, there are no co-sponsors. Uh, we'll move on to those in favor and uh, we'll recognize Director Champion again. Oh, technology. <laughs> We're all Again. ducked it off this morning. <laughs> Again. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, distinguished members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. Again, I am Milton Champion, Executive Director of the Gambling Control Unit with the Department of Public Safety. And I'm here today on behalf of the Department of Public Safety to testify in favor of, seven, of LD 1745, which is an act to amend the laws governing the Gambling Control Board. 
This board would, or this bill would allow employee licensees issued by the Gambling Control Board to be renewed for either a one-year term or a three-year term. Uh, the renewal fee for a one-year employee license would be uh, the current $25 fee. The renewal fee for a three-year employee license would be $50. Therefore, the employee would save over a three-year period uh, $25. I did go over this with the uh, Department of Administrative and Financial Services, and they indicated that it would reduce revenues uh, every six-year cycle by about $40,000 which would actually be pretty minimal compared to the staff time to process these annual licenses. Uh, these uh, licenses, uh, we do an, on average between 750 to 800 licenses every year. And these are individual employees. So uh, they would be casino employees, distributor employees. Uh, and uh, so this would give them a chance. So they would still uh, initially they would still apply and, and pay the initial fee, but upon their, their first renewal, they would have the option to go from, uh, to get away from just the one year every year to go to a three-year license. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity to bring this bill before you today. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Director Champion. Uh, Representative Kinney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Director Champion, um, for pointing out uh, you're going to DAFs and, and learning about where the, the costs are going to be on this, because this is obviously going to have to be something we do as a, um, if we do pass, this has to be ought to pass as amended, because there will be a fiscal note associated. Um, based on what we went through with this last, um, the last bill, I think we really do want to wait for an analysis so we can see just where this is coming from so that we can see the DAS report, unless, um, Director, you have that report that you could get to us, or either way, if we could get that report before we make a decision on this bill, that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I do believe it was submitted, but I'll, uh, I, I can check with Senator or check with uh, Karen uh, at a different time, but I, I'm, I'm sure the fiscal note was submitted already. Great, thank you very much. You bet. Any other questions for Director Champion? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, I don't see anybody else on the list for uh, either in favor, uh, opposed, or neither for nor against. So uh, if there's anybody in the attendee room that would like to testify on LD 1745, please raise your virtual hands and I will recognize you and bring you into the room. Okay, seeing none, then we will close the public hearing on LD 1745. Okay, up next, uh, let's see, I'm just looking at the attendee list here to make sure everybody's in and we can move forward. Looks like we can. Okay, moving on. Um, let's open the public hearing for LD 1750, which is an act to create a framework for Maine Spirits contract. And at this time, I will recognize the bill sponsor, Senator Lupini. Thank you, uh, Chairman Chiazzo, uh, Representative Chiazzo, members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. Uh, my name is again, Louis Lucchini. I represent most of Hancock County in the Senate. And I'm here presenting now LD 1750, which is an act to create a framework for Maine Spirits contract. Um, as you can see, this is uh, simply a, a concept draft at the moment. Uh, the goal of, of this would be to establish the RFP process uh, for the next state spirits contract. The current contract that we're under has been um, very, very successful for the state. We've grown the business, uh, taken back market share from New Hampshire, used the revenues to pay off hospital debt. Um, and we've had a great relationship with our vendor, uh, Pine State, who's done a great job in managing the contract and, and delivering to our agency stores. Um, this contract will end at the end of June in 2014. 
So this will get us an early start to um, establish the RFP process. And then if there are any appeals or anything like that, we'll give the state sufficient time uh, to react to that. Uh, so as I said, this is a concept uh, draft and that the committee will be able to use this as a vehicle um, for any to really include any changes that, that the committee believes should be part of the next contract or part of the alcohol uh, spirits landscape for the state of Maine uh, for the next period of the liquor contract. Um, obviously, if we make those changes in advance, it will give the bidders uh, all the information that they need to accurately bid on the contract at any time as they move forward. So this, you know, I've asked industry participants just to bring their ideas on what they'd like to see on the next contract, as well as Bablo. Um, just any ways we can improve it. It's been, as, we, as I said, you know, very, very successful, but if there's ways that we can make it better for the next round, uh, we should. So with that, I will conclude and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator. I just want to clarify, I think you said 2014, I think you meant 2024, correct? Yeah, sorry, yeah, started 2014 to 2024, so yeah, my, my bad. No worries, no worries, thank you, sir. Uh, any questions for Senator Lucchini? Okay, seeing none, uh, then we'll move on to public testimony. Uh, we will start with those in favor, and let me see if I can find, uh, let's see, we'll bring in Director Minio. And I think I promoted him correctly. Looks like he's coming in. And there he goes. Good morning. Good morning. morning, sir. We can hear you, but we can't see you. If you're okay with that, then, no, then you change, can proceed. I'm gonna, change, I'm gonna change that. Although I may not be okay with it. But I'm <laughs> 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 Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody. Um, so Senator Lucchini, Representative Kayazo, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. My name is Greg Minio. I'm the director of the Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages and Lottery Operations. And I am providing the following written testimony to indicate the Bureau's support and commitment to LD 1750 in concept. This measure creates a framework for the next main spirits contract and will set a course for a succeeding business model to continue the already successful deliverables and inspire enhancements, which will take the business into the next 10 year period beginning July 1, 2024. The current business model's beginning coincided with the start of the spirits contract entered into on July 1, 2014, and it continues to drive responsible sales and deliver significant profits to the state while paying down the bond that satisfied the hospital debt significantly ahead of schedule and transferred funds to the Cascade and General Fund. A recap of the financials for the first seven years is below. I won't read all the numbers, but I'll just point to the committee. Uh, the compounded annual growth rate on the far right, you'll see that for sales, uh, which are cases, by the way, dollar sales, operating profit, and the all important transfer to the main municipal bond bank, the numbers are um, healthy, to say the least. The projected profits for the 10 year model will total approximately $528 million versus $189 million for the previous 10-year lease arrangement with Maine Beverage, almost triple the return for the state. Furthermore, beyond the benefit to the state, this business model has helped to grow the number of licensed agency liquor stores from 483 to 608, bolstered retailer profits from $18.6 million to $44.1 million annually. It administered a trade support platform through working in lockstep with Pine State Spirits and provided an efficient ordering and fulfillment platform that is highly regarded by the retailer community. Main Spirits is the state's forward-facing brand and through its orderly list listing process, it has afforded the agency liquor stores a wide selection of national, regional, and local products that now exceeds 4,000 codes. The development of a competitively priced selection of spirits products has proven to repatriate those main consumers and visitors who previously purchased their spirits from New Hampshire. 
by proving a better value to Maine consumers. And in no small degree, our robust consumer communication platform through its web page, mobile app, and social network channels has contributed to this mitigation of lost sales to our neighboring state. There are multiple mechanisms to facilitate the final product from this proposed framework, namely through statute, rulemaking, an RFP process, contract terms, and of course, business practice. All must be relevant and work together for a business to succeed and deliver a fair price to consumers and maintain a vibrant relationship with the agency liquor stores. The required structure and foundation are already in place from the work done in 2013. Through our learnings from managing this model and more recently from stakeholder meetings, we look forward to enhancing a proven business model through an open, fair, and transparent process. Thank you for allowing me to testify before the committee today. Of course, happy to respond to any questions and will be available for the work session. Thank you, Director Minio. Uh, any questions for the director? Representative Kinney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is this, we're looking at this contract going in in 2024. Are we able to actually make a new contract this year that would go into effect in 2024? Because 2024 is technically the next legislative session. So being new to the committee, and of course, the last time this was done was 10 years ago or eight years ago. How does that work as far as putting through, or are we just going to, will this concept draft turn into more of a resolve where we direct the department to come up with something for the, the 134 first legislature? Um, I think it's probably more of the latter. Um, I, I think what this does, this sets up the framework for beginning the RFP process. So if that's what the, the, the will of the committee is and the, and the legislature, uh, that's what this would do. I can give you a quick idea of what the timeline may look like, and this is sort of fluid, but uh, if this is approved by the legislature, signed by the governor, um, let's say sometime um, in, this, in this first quarter, uh, we feel fairly confident that we can issue or the evaluation team will issue uh, the RFP uh, probably no later than June of this year, we think. Um, Proposals then would be due, let's say, in August of this year. Uh, a bidder award, a conditional award, could actually be issued as early as the fourth quarter of this year. Um, and then from there, contract negotiations, certainly allowing time for a potential appeal, uh, that would be uh, there. So we, we feel strongly that if this moves forward as we think uh, it's going to, uh, we think we can have a contract actually signed uh, sometime in first quarter of 23, which will give us plenty of time uh, prior to uh, the beginning of the next 10-year uh, program. Does that answer your question? I hope it does. Yes, thank you very much, Director. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Kinney. Any other questions for Director Minio? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony this morning. All right. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, James Bass, and we'll be followed by Adam Nappy. So, Mr. Bass, when you're ready, please, uh, your name, the town you're from, and who you're representing, if anybody, please. Sure. Uh, Happy, New Year, Happy New Year to you all. I'm James Bass. I live in Augusta, and I'm here on behalf of Pine State Trading. Um, we want to thank the um, we want to thank Director Minio um, and his staff Tim and Tracy they for their leadership they've been terrific over the last seven years in this in this con uh, in this contract um, in the testimony I lay out the the history of the contract Representative Tuttle and Senator Lucchini can fill you in on on uh, all the color commentary of how it occurred um, it was it was really interesting and and Pine State has done a terrific job since then in the partnership between Pine State uh, and Babalo really has been, um, the, the success of the business has been a testament to that partnership. Um, Pine State has brought a, a lot to the table. Um, the, the sort of the hub of Pine State is its warehouse here in Augusta. And so that's the warehouse where all spirits come in. Uh, they are offloaded, then the orders are fulfilled to agents, and then those orders go out across the state, um, all over the state. 
So that, that warehouse team is 42 person strong, uh, nine to 10 tractor trailer trucks come in per day. It takes about an hour for the Pine States team to unload one. Um, there are 250,000 cases of spirits in the warehouse. Um, just sort of to note, when the contract started, there were a little under 4,000 different items available for sale on the shelf. There are now over 5,000 items. So that SKU count uh, has, has increased. So those orders come in, Pine State packages them and then pushes them out with their distribution team. Um, when the contract started, there were uh, Pine State made 35,000 deliveries to 533 agents. This past year, Pine State has made 50,000 deliveries to 651 agents. So deliveries up, agents up, businesses up. Um, Pine State and Bablo have grown together um, and have grown with the business. As the business has grown, you know, both have put more resources behind this to make this uh, incredibly successful. Pine State's IT team does a lot, making sure that agents have the ability to order um, online uh, with the latest technology. Uh, Pine State's support to the agents also is boots on the ground. Um, they do sales analysis, trend data, merchandising recommendations, and really best practices. So Pine State sends that team out. So, um, you know, with, with Babylon and Pine State, you're, you're the, the agents that are across the state are getting uh, that type of, um, that contact um, and that industry experience from Pine State uh, uh, every, every day. And lastly, Pine State and Babylon work uh, marketing to make sure that that message is communicated to consumers across the state via traditional uh, and new media as well. So as I see Representative Giazzo giving me, giving me my countdown, what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that the right bottle um, is in the right place at the right time and the right price. The partnership has been successful. Um, and the one plug that we would have is that one of the reasons it has been successful is that there is one contract. Uh, I think Bablo, you know, would concur. It's it's much easier for a monopoly like this to be run by um, to have sort of all aspects of this: warehousing, distribution, and marketing. And with that, thank you very much for allowing me to go a little bit over. And happy to get any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bass, and and thank you for uh, being the subject of the first Grim Reaper attack of the second <laughs> session. So I appreciate your I appreciate your your your, uh, your 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 good good nature about it. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Bass? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, up next uh, is Adam Nappy. So if you could, please, Mr. Nappy, please state your name, uh, the town you're from, and who you're representing, if anybody, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. And just, uh, just before you start, though, uh, he'll be followed by Andrew Hackman and then Christine Cummings. So sorry, Mr. Nappy, please proceed. Thank you very much. My name is Adam Nappy. I live in Freeport. I represent Bow Street Market in Freeport and Bow Street Beverage. In fact, I'm the owner along with my wife of those two businesses. Um, our businesses serve both the retail community and the on-premise community through our agency liquor licenses. Our company employs about 120 team members. Uh, we are proud also to have three generations participating in our family owned business. I am here today in support of LD 1750, an act to create a framework for Maine Spirits contract, a concept. First, I'd like to commend Senator Lucchini and the VLA committee for presenting LD 750 this year. We'd also like to recognize the efforts of the administration through DAFs for their support in bringing forward this concept in a timely manner. And lastly, under the leadership of Director Minio and Deputy Director Poole and Bablo has been an invaluable partner with the agency store community. Thank you. Together, LD750 will provide a stable and predictable process for all stakeholders. I participated along with many other retailers on the main grocers and food producers spirits contract subcommittee. Uh, soon you'll be hearing from Christine Cummings, the executive director. Uh, beginning several months ago, we had been meeting on this matter and created several recommendations being presented today. Those recommendations are taking a long-term long and strategic look 
at the business for the next 10 years. Contained in the testimony to be presented by main grocers and food producers, we give careful consideration to the future of responsible spirit sales. We cover the future getting spirits to consumers, enhancing discount rates and incentive plans for responsible growth. Importantly, an upgrading of the language from major substantive to routine technical will allow the system to adapt at a higher rate of speed and in real time. We also offer recommendations to the committee of ideas to improve the future contract and other important items. They include, but are not limited to, the ability to extend the contract, unlock supply chain opportunities, and adding an enhanced marketing concept and a few other minor updates. Lastly, we support the current structure of the contract. It has been beneficial for all the stakeholders. And it is my recommendation that the main structure of this current contract continues forward with some minor outline, thank you, uh, minor improvements outlined in the MG FDA testimony. Thank you for allowing me to testify and contribute to this concept bill, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Nappy. Perfect timing. <laughs> Much appreciated. Any questions for Mr. Nappy from the, from the committee? Seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Uh, next up, we'll have Andrew Hackman. Uh, he'll be followed by Christine Cummings and then David McConnell. So if you could, Mr. Hackman, uh, please state your name, the town you're from, and who you are representing, if anyone. You may proceed when you are ready, sir. Uh, good morning, Chairman Chiazzo, Rep or Senator Lucchini, and members of the Veterans Legal Affairs Committee. My name is Andrew Hackman, President of Union, representing the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States. We are the uh, largest and leading uh, trade association for spirits manufacturers in the United States. We appreciate uh, the success that the spirits contract has had for the last eight years and appreciate Senator Lucchini bringing this bill forward and having all stakeholders involved in the process to begin to shape the next contract. We've appreciated the growth and the breadth of expansion that uh, the industry has seen in the last eight years in a responsible way. We want to encourage that continued growth. I'll remind the committee that spirits in terms of the alcohol industry is the only sector that is run in this manner. And so it's unique in that sense. And it's important that we have all stakeholders involved in the continued growth of the industry. And we look forward to basically participating and continuing to be a part of the process as this moves forward. We have um, certainly uh, solicited input from our members. We are continuing to, to solicit that input on items that might need to be addressed in the contract. But at this point, uh, are continuing to just support the, the current structure and look forward to being a player as the, uh, the process moves forward. So uh, appreciate the time today. I will get under the three minute clock and uh, hopefully answer any questions as this continues to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Hackman. You are, you are holding the record for the shortest testimony so far this, this session. So congratulations, thank you. <laughs> any questions for Mr. Hackman from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Uh, up next, we have uh, Christine Cummings, followed by David McConnell, and then Stephen Roop. So if you could, Ms. Cummings, please uh, name, town you're from, and who you are representing, if anyone. And you can begin when you are ready. Great. Chairman Chiazzo, Senator Lucchini, and members of the Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs, my name is Christine Cummings, and I am the Executive Director of the Maine Grocers and Food Producers Association. Our association primarily represents grocers, including Maine's agency liquor stores. We applaud the legislature and the administration for undertaking this important effort to address Maine's spirits business. I've truncated my testimony to meet the three minutes, but I encourage you to review our full length written testimony, which includes examples and further justification for our legislative recommendations. We also will follow up with suggested draft language, which covers these recommendations. MGFPA formed a subcommittee of our membership to review optimal changes in the model to guarantee continued success. <clears throat> 
Um, our committee in total represented almost 100 licensed agency stores, including independent stores and supermarkets. The current model in Maine has proven to be highly effective for consumers of Maine, the state, and the state's essential partners, the agency liquor stores. The state's retail agency stores are essential partners in the consumer sales portion of the Maine spirits business. They perform many crucial duties to ensure that the product reaches the vetted end consumer. The following are our legislative recommendations. Establish the foundational concept that licensed agency retail stores will be the entity to sell and deliver spirits through direct-to-consumer sales if enabling direct-to-consumer legislation is established in the future. We recommend that the, the change of the minimum discount rate from the current 18% to 20%. The discount rate is the percent off the retail price in which retailers purchase the product from the state, essentially the retailer's margin. 20% is fiscally responsible while recognizing the work of these stores. This new minimum will allow for continued capital investment by agency stores and ultimately back into the spirits business. Next, establish language that directs the Bureau to reformat the graduated discount rates from two retail price levels to three price levels. Support the economic development and sales of spirits manufactured in Maine with a minimum discount of 25%. As Adam mentioned, we would like to permit at the discretion of the commissioner the ability to negotiate and enter into a contract while incorporating any modifications, uh, excuse me, contract extension. Next, specific to the special pricing situation and rules, we would like to require that Babel will set a minimum price for allocated items, that the Bureau shall adopt rules biannually, and that the sales incentives will be updated to routine technical for major substantive. Specific to the contract bidder, we look for them to promote highly efficient operations by proposing incentives for full cases, pallets, pre-sales, and other discounts. We also would like to require that they replace and provide invoice credit for damaged, outdated, and broken products. Of particular interest is we would like to see a quarterly cooperative marketing incentive fund created. This would support licensed agent stores in their custom promotions and campaigns. Our stores are seeking supplemental financial support for local advertising efforts. We are encouraged by the opportunity to further discuss the details of the trade marketing contract, in particular our shared interest in one contract for necessary synergy and seamless business growth. We would also like to see the contractor establish a baseline for three deliveries per week. And lastly, a few minor yet important legislative recommendations include prohibiting the purchases via credit cards from on-premise licensees from a reselling agent and for on-premise licensees operating a seasonal business, we would like to prohibit them from returning product to reselling agents. Thank you for your attention and consideration of our legislative recommendations. Again, I've provided all of this um, in much more detail in writing and we'll send some draft language. We look forward to working with you and remaining engaged stakeholders in this process. Thank you, Ms. Cummings. Um, I don't, I, I'm on the website and I could be wrong. I don't see the written testimony uh, on there. Did you submit that or um, you did submit that? Okay, all right. Yeah, I received confirmation. So hopefully it should be there for you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Ms. Cummings from the committee? All right, seeing none. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have David McConnell uh, and he will be followed by uh, Stephen Roop, and uh, that will end the in favor, uh, those testifying in favor. So, Mr. McConnell, when you are ready, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Representative Chiazzo, Senator Lucchini, and other members of the committee. I'm David McConnell. I live in Falmouth, and I'm one of the co-founders of Three of Strong Spirits, which is a uh, a small Maine distillery uh, located in Portland, Maine. And by way of disclosure, we've got 12 employees full and part-time. One of those part-time employees is Representative Riley. Uh, does an excellent job. So come in and get a drink from him. Uh, does that mean but, he's gonna need to recuse himself from, from the, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's <laughs> that's not my hunt. That's yours. But <laughs> but I did just want to. Uh, I didn't not. I did not submit uh, written testimony. Um, I really just wanted to say, for purposes of this hearing, um, to offer a thank you to this committee and to Senator Lucchini for bringing forward the concept bill uh, with so much lead time, which I think really should allow. Um, 
the committee and stakeholders an opportunity to engage uh, in terms of what what uh, what would be the right uh, the things that 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 the committee would like to see uh, uh, in terms of the RFP process for the next uh, liquor contract. Um, I'm not going to. Uh, I, I I now want the record for the shortest testimony this session, so uh, I'll stop there. Only to say that again, I uh, I know that um, small distilleries like mine would love to be a part of the process uh, as we go forward to talk about this uh, this concept bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McConnell Gold Star, for the testimony. Hopefully, we'll have a reward for the shortest one at the end of the session. Any questions for Mr. McConnell? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Uh, and then wrapping up those speaking in favor is Mr. Roop. Mr. Roop, when you are, uh, when you're ready. And if you could, please state your name, the town you're from and who you are representing, if anybody. Uh, good morning to uh, all of you representatives on the uh, Legal and Veterans Affairs Committee. Thanks for having good. us this morning. Good morning, sir. We can hear you, but we can't see you. So if you're okay with that, we, we yeah. are as well. I'm okay with that. I, I'm having okay. a bad hair day anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm, I'm the owner of uh, Rupert's uh, Beverage and Redemption Centers. We hold uh, six licenses for liquor in uh, two counties and three communities in the state. Um, we've, we've got 90 plus strong employees. And um, I just want to be, in, uh, be on record as supporting uh, Mr. Minio and uh, Mr. Poulin for doing a marvelous job with this last contract. I think uh, right now the team is built uh, between Bablo and Pine State, the service has been so much better than it was 20 years ago. Um, when the first uh, licenses came out, we had uh, sidewalk delivery. Um, so it's been a pleasant, pleasant surprise for everybody. I think the RFP and what they're doing with that is, is uh, it's been beneficial to everybody. And it, it, it helps promote the product to people like uh, like Rupert's of O Street or any of the other people out there. They know they that two percent difference with the growth of sales makes a huge difference. I don't know how they're going to tackle it this time around, but I like the fact that you're getting started early on this process, and it's going to make it a lot more seamless for agency stores like myself. And it'll make it a lot easier on Bablo and, and uh, Greg and uh, <clears throat> Tim Poolin also. But I just wanted to uh, say thank you to Bablo and Pine State for bringing the liquor industry where it's at right now. Wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Uh, that's about all I have to say. I want to go on record of supporting it and be happy to take any questions from uh, any of uh, the representatives. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Roop. We, we appreciate your testimony uh, this morning. Uh, Representative Wood. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Roop, I, I'm sorry, at the very beginning, you introduced yourself and you, you described what your business was. And I heard you say you were in two counties. Could, can you just repeat that again? I, sure, I we've got six locations. Okay. Uh, we've got three in Lewiston, uh, two in Auburn, and one in Oxford. And um, we, we've just, I've uh, 30 years in business now, and uh, I've had a liquor license for about 20 years when they first started doling out the private licenses uh, back in early 2000. But uh, that's what we do. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Representative Wood. Any other questions for Mr. Roop? All right, seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony this morning. Yeah, thank you to the board, thank you. Uh, up next, we have Topher Mallory. So if you could please, sir, uh, your name, the town you're from, and uh, who you're representing, if anyone, please. Good morning, my name is Topher Mallory. I am one of two founders 
at Split Rock Distilling. I'm a resident of Walpole, just down the street from Newcastle, where the distillery is situated here in Midcoast, Maine. We employ six full-time employees at this point, all on the production side of the house. We have part-time in our tasting room when it is open. And we've been in business coming into six years with our doors open, and we've been producing for seven years. We are primarily a whiskey distillery, so it took us a while to build the inventory in order to really have a product made from scratch. I'd like to thank you all for uh, having me here and giving us a voice. I'd also like to thank Senator Lucchini for all of the legislation we have seen to date. It's been uh, an incredible journey and we've seen many improvements. So I thank you all as part of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee for making that happen. Again, thank you for having me here today. And I would also endorse that we too feel strongly that Babylon, Pine State, the agency stores that are here, the organizations uh, like Maine Grocers and food producers that have advocated and improved this process have uh, made it easy to say that we are in favor of this coming contract. And all I would like to add is that I hope in this framework that there are considerations made for this new and burgeoning, burgeoning distillery business that I'm a part of. I think in 2014, there were five or six of us. Uh, 10 years ago, there were maybe seven or eight. And uh, here we are, um, uh, over 20, I believe. So one uh, point I'd like to just put on the table for consideration is allowing agency stores, not just distilleries, to participate in the B2C world of e-commerce. It's a huge and growing part of our industry. And we are looking to ship in a uh, way that coincides with all the requirements that by not only our state, but other states. We know there's other legislation out there uh, working in this direction. And we're just hoping that the contract allows this to uh, happen if, if the state chooses to. We'd also like to see uh, the continued improvement of the listing and pricing process. We were big fans of everything we saw in the last five or six years and being able to move quickly is a big part of our small nimble business. Last up is an investment uh, continued to be made in main made products through marketing and pricing incentives, prioritizing the promotion of distilleries with main made items. Um, and I'll keep it under three minutes. I'll wrap up right here. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Mr. Mallory. I uh, appreciate your, your, your courtesy with the time, for sure. Any questions from the committee? Representative McCrate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Mallory, you raised a question I don't know the answer to. Currently, our main made products, is there um, the kind of promotion that you're talking about for marketing and price incentives? Or are you suggesting that should be added? I'm suggesting that that should be added. I don't believe that there is a wording that would satisfy both the concept of regional promotion, national promotion, and beyond. We look to the brewing industry for an example of success in this department where Maine Made has become not just a regional uh, benefit, but something that is known now globally with, um, with beer. We think there's a lot of opportunity and one that could help to the sales growth that y'all have been so successful with, with all spirits. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Mallory. A follow-up? Please. Just a statement, really. You're making me think of the Lobster Marketing Collaborative, which is promoting um, obviously promoting lobster um, with, um, you know, being able to shift quickly with, for example, the pandemic. Um, so just a thought. Thank you. Thank you, Representative McCrate. Representative Kinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative McCrate got me thinking too. We have a, a main made promotion within the um, DECD economic development has anyone in the spirits industry looked into that program? Because it's been very successful for a lot of food producers and other 
uh, crafters and, and so forth. It's truly just a main made um, program. And it really has been a, a good kickoff for a lot of, of, of small business owners here in Maine. It is why I brought forth the point. We do participate both with our distillery and our non-alcoholic Royal Rose uh, food products. And it's been wonderful, not just uh, everything they've helped advocate for, but the logo they've created at Main Made is certainly uh, a wonderful addition to our products. And I think, again, there's huge opportunity within spirits and the 20 plus distilleries promoting Maine spirits. A quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Sure, please. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I don't have a problem with trying to do some promotion for, for Maine Made and, and certainly promote that myself. I, I make maple syrup. I think Maine maple syrup is better than anything made anywhere else, Canada, Vermont, you know. But uh, this, <laughs> uh, I, I also have served um, on state and local government and ag conservation and forestry where we had to deal with the commerce clause, interstate commerce clause, and just worried about what promotion could do. I don't know, just wondering if that's something we need to be concerned about if we try to promote main products over. I mean, just promotion probably isn't a problem, but um, wondering if we should be just, I don't know if that's something that we need to be worried about with, with this with the, within the contract. Yeah, thank you for that, Rosen I'm sure, you know, as we get into the work session, we'll, a lot of these details we'll be able to, you know, hash out and, and put that stuff on the table. And I think, Mr. Mallory, I see you have written testimony, and hopefully those points that you brought up are in the written testimony as well, and we can reference that. And certainly, if, you know, if we need to bring you back for the work session, we can, we can have you back and, and uh, dig into that a little bit further uh, also, if you'd like. Um, sorry, Representative Kenny, I don't know if that answered your question or not. <laughs> Well, I, I think I think it is something we need to look at and be, be cautious of because that has been something that we've dealt with with lumber, with food, with other things. And I, I don't want to put something in the contract if we're already using some of the programs that we already have for, for marketing. Um, not sure putting it in the contract is the right way to do that. Right, understood. Thank you. And then, by the way, um, her maple syrup is probably some of the best ever. I have had it and it's very good. So that's on the record, of course. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Mallory? Seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Appreciate your, your, your taking the time this morning. Uh, I think that wraps up everybody that is speaking for. Um, I don't see anybody listed as speaking against, so we will move on to speaking neither for nor against. And I understand Mr. Damon is having some audio troubles. So um, I'll leave him in the, in the room. If that changes, um, we'll bring him up. But in the interim, uh, we can go with uh, Mr. Auger. Uh, Representative Wood, you had a question, I'm sorry. I just wanted to uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I saw Mr. Damon's note that he was having trouble with his audio. So w when I went in and looked at his written testimony, he's listed under, oh, I'm sorry. Once again, I'm just getting back into the swing of things. <laughs> I thought it said something else. <laughs> Thank you. At least you're reading it like we promised. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Auger, for your patience. Um, uh, I will give you the floor, sir, when you are ready. Um, as always, your name, please, where you're, the town you're from, and who you are representing, if anybody. And you may start when you wish. Thank you, Representative Chiazzo and, and Senator Lucchini and members of the committee. My name is Newell Auger. I'm a partner with Pierce Atwood, a resident of Yarmouth, um, but a native of Portland, which is where my client, RSCP Discount Beverages, is located. Uh, Kathy Sullivan is the owner there, uh, has about 35 employees. She actually started as a cashier uh, back in the 80s and had an opportunity to purchase the business and now uh, and now runs it. And I just would want to uh, piggyback onto what uh, Steve Roop had said. Um, I'm listed here as neither for nor against, um, largely just because as a, out of principle, I, I, I try not to put a support next to legislation that I have not seen in a concept draft, but that's not in any way uh, a reflection of the great work that this committee has done um, that, uh, that uh, Greg Minio and Tim Poulin have done um, in, in making this contract and this arrangement 
uh, successful. And that, that would be just the simple point I'd make that it, it's been successful for the state, certainly for the reasons that, that the director Minio has mentioned. It's been successful for agency stores. Um, it's also been successful for the consumer. Uh, and, and I think that's an important point to make. So I would close with that. The only, the only thing I would throw out there, and Kathy and I looked at this, we, we were not part of the um, grocers group. Uh, we had a chance to review some of those suggestions in the last 24, 48 hours. Uh, and, and I think they're uh, certainly uh, viable ones that, that should be considered and some included. Um, the only other piece is that the, the contract is technically scheduled to expire at the end of June. And, and if there were to be any sort of a change, um, that is a terrible time of year for that to happen uh, for agency stores. And so perhaps in the future, someone might put a date in February or something like that. Just a thought, it's a minor point, but if it ever got to that, it probably would be, would, would be a, a, a nightmare uh, or definitely would be a nightmare for agency stores to have to adjust right at the heart of the best time of the year sales-wise. So um, it's great to see all you again on Zoom because uh, uh, it's so much fun and um, to do it this way. And thank you for, for your, your service uh, uh, virtually. Thank you, Mr. Auger. I'll, I will take that for the surface. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Any, any and I, by the way, I apologize. I don't have my written testimony, but I will send that to Karen before close of business today, so it'll be on the record. Uh, I see something in there, but um, I, again, maybe that's that might be just a placeholder or something. I'm not sure. So yeah, it um, is. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Argo while we have him here? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you batting cleanup and. Uh, uh, we will uh, probably see you, I guess, on, on, on a couple of the other bills that are coming up for sure. For sure. Thank you, sir. Um, so that concludes the people signed up for testimony. Uh, if there's anybody in the attendee room that wishes to testify that has not testified, please raise your virtual hand and we will uh, bring you, we will recognize you and bring you into the room. Okay, seeing none, then we will close the public hearing on LD 1750. And moving on, we will uh, open up the public hearing for LD 1751, which is an act to make permanent the changes to the liquor laws made by public law 2021 chapters three and 91. And we will open up the public hearing with testimony from the bill sponsor, Senator Lucchini, when you are ready, sir. Thank you, uh, Representative Chiazzo, members of the committee. Uh, it's a busy day this morning. My name's Louis Lucchini. I represent most of Hancock County in the main Senate. And I'm here today to present LD 1751, an act to make permanent the changes to the liquor laws uh, made by public law 2021 chapters three and 91, which is an exciting title that <laughs> would essentially make permanent the ability of restaurants uh, and distilleries to sell takeaway al alcohol uh, or sales or cocktails to go along with, with food. Um, so as this committee is well aware, uh, the ability to sell alcohol to go has been going on since the beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, and by all counts that I've heard, it's been a success. Um, initially, this directive was part of an executive order by the governor at the outset of the uh, pandemic in conjunction with BABLO. And of course, last session, uh, we put through emergency legislation uh, to extend this ability uh, until September of this year. Um, and we did that for a couple of reasons. Um, in part, it was in anticipation of the ending of the state of emergency, at which points restaurants would have lost their ability to sell to go, which would have been really difficult right before the busy summer season. Um, but it also gave us a couple more uh, or another year to watch and analyze the program in action. And uh, since then, I've spoken with dozens of restaurants in my district and across the state, and it's been nearly unanimously positive. Uh, given the success of the program over the past two years, um, I've submitted this legislation this term uh, to make this uh, privilege uh, permanent, if you will. So included in that legislation last session, we also included um, craft distillers. 
who originally weren't in the governor's executive order. Um, and this bill continues to have their inclusion um, as they're certainly a growing and very important industry in the state of Maine. Um, as we've heard in the past from groups like Hospitality Maine and other industry participants, uh, the ability to sell alcohol to go with orders has in some cases kept businesses going during the pandemic. It's certainly given them useful tools to make ends meet during an extraordinarily difficult time. And as we're going through this time now, I think uh, you know we're gonna continue to deal with COVID and with waves of COVID and variants. And many people are still uncomfortable uh, dining out. So this ability to sell cocktails to go along with takeout food um, offers those people a restaurant experience that they can have safely at home. Uh, and again, this gives restaurants one more tool as we hopefully emerge um, from the pandemic. So given the importance of the restaurant industry in the state of Maine, I think this is a, a great tool for restaurant owners. Um, and with that, I'll conclude and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Senator Lucchini. Any questions for the Senator? Senator Farron. Yeah, I just, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just gonna ask the Senator if he has a goal to have uh, the most bills introduced this session. <laughs> Starting off with a bang today. <laughs> <laughs> Any other pertinent questions from the committee? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you, Senator, for kicking us off. Um, we'll move right. on to- I'll have a cocktail delivered over to Senator Farron shortly, so. <laughs> I mean, you can't break the seal while we're, while we're meeting. Uh, okay, we're gonna move on to the public uh, portion. We'll start with those in favor, uh, and I will recognize Director Minio from Bablo. Uh, if you'd like, sir, you have the floor. All right, good morning again. Senator Lucchini, Representative Cayazzo, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. My name is Greg Minio, and I'm the Director of the Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages and Lottery Operations. I am providing the following testimony, generally supportive of LD 1751, while identifying one cause for concern that tempers our enthusiasm. This legislation intends to make permanent the ability for a qualified on-premise retailer and qualified distillery to sell liquor for off-premise consumption, which is currently scheduled to sunset in September 10, on September 10, 2022. Across the country, many states did just like Maine and afforded on-premise licensees the ability to sell beer, wine, and cocktails to go when their on-premise establishments were forced to close during the pandemic. Given the profit margins on liquor sales, liquor to go proved an invaluable lifeline to restaurants and bars during the most challenging times they'd ever faced. In the last two years, 15 other states have already extended liquor to go sales on a permanent basis. Only two states, New York and Pennsylvania, have allowed their liquor to go provisions to expire, eliciting significant outcry from restaurants and bars, still finding themselves in precarious financial position. Both states are now considering measures to restore liquor to go. While restaurants and bars are less reliant on liquor to go than they were initially, with the current staffing shortages they're experiencing due to the Omicron surge and no telling how long the pandemic will continue to linger, the Bureau recognizes that liquor to go continues to provide a helping hand up to the industry. That being said, the Bureau has a dual commitment to ensuring and promoting responsible drinking. So we didn't want to withhold from the committee the fact that our colleagues at the Maine CDC did recently convey to us their public health and safety concerns over liquor to go primarily that carding seems to be inconsistent. The Bureau has no evidence of our own that there has been any issue with almost 300 on-premise licensees offering cocktails to go. However, we must be forthright that with only five liquor inspectors to cover the entire state and who are responsible for almost 7,000 licensees across all license types, the Bureau's enforcement efforts are primarily driven by tips we receive from the public. We have inadequate staff capacity to actively monitor compliance surrounding liquor to go. On-premise licensees need to take their responsibility to ver verify customers' ages just as seriously for liquor to go orders as they do customers drinking on their premises. 
Thank you for allowing me to testify before the committee today. Happy to respond. Any questions, of course, will be available for that. So, thank you. Thank you, Director Minio. Any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir. We look forward to seeing and hearing from you at the work session, for sure. Okay, uh, moving on to those still in favor, we will start with um, Kimberly Cook, followed by Stephen DeMillo, and then Greg Dougal uh, after that. So Ms. Cook, if you could, please state your name, the town you're from, and what group you represent, if any. Thank you, and good morning, Chair Chiazzo and members of the committee. I'm Kim Cook. I'm a resident of Portland, uh, and I'm a lawyer who's focused on practice on government relations for the past 15 years, although seldom laid before your committee. Uh, I'm here today to speak in support of LD 1751 on behalf of Bow Street Beverage. And you heard from Adam Nappy earlier. Um, I'll, I'm uh, happy to be working alongside of him this session. Uh, as you heard, Bow Street Market in Freeport and Bow Street Beverage in Portland are agency liquor stores that serve both the retail community and the on-premises community. And the company is owned by Sheila and Adam Nappy and employs approximately 120 team members and is proud to have three generations participating in their family owned business. Bow Street uh, thanks Senator Lucchini uh, and expresses our strong support for this bill as it recognizes that the temporary changes made uh, in Maine law have worked very well and should become permanent. We are here to support our on-premises partners who have responsibly adapted to this pandemic and urge the committee to support the bill to continue these needed adaptations. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Uh, any questions for Ms. Cook while we have her before the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Thank you. Uh, up next, we'll have uh, Stephen DeMillo, followed by Greg Dougal, and then Andrew Hackman. So, uh, Mr. DeMillo, floor is yours, sir, when you are ready. Good morning. My name is Steve DeMillo. I represent my family. We operate DeMillo's on the Water in Portland. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Lucchini for uh, bringing this bill to the uh, committee. Uh, also, Representative Chiazzo and the balance of the BLA committee. Uh, I speak in support of 1751 um, with hopes that this will this rule will be adopted as a permanent measure um, to the state liquor laws. Uh, this allowance has helped many operators, large and small, make ends meet. And during this crazy time of the pandemic, uh, we are looking under every rock for a, a way to keep our business rolling uh, or floating, as I say, and to keep our employees uh, employed. Um, as the past chair of Hospitality Maine, um, I've heard from many operators uh, hoping that this will become law uh, and um, the change in the location, uh, change in the legislation uh, will help again members uh, meet their bottom line. Um, and I, I think that also uh, the concern that Mr. Minio had um, about um, enforcement, um, I think. The, the uh, licensees all value their licenses and do what we can to ensure that uh, folks that are purchasing alcohol uh, to go are of age. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. DeMillo. Any, anytime we can sneak in a nautical reference on this committee is always appreciated. Any questions for Mr. DeMillo while he is, uh, he is before us? Uh, Representative McCrate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeMillo. Um, I think you raised a, a really good point about sort of um, self-monitoring that licensees are doing. Is that something that the industry discusses and promotes with each other to make sure that everybody's following the rules? It certainly is guidance that we've shared uh, as an industry and uh, we certainly can, uh, I know, Greg Dougal, our government affairs director, can speak to that better than myself. Uh, but it's definitely in the 
in the discussion about uh, alcohol to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative McCray. Any other questions for Mr. DeMillo? All right, seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony this morning. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have uh, Greg Dougal, followed by Andrew Hickman, and then David McConnell. So, Mr. Dougal, welcome back. Uh, good to see you again. And please, when you are ready, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, great to see you all as well. Happy New Year. Senator Lucchini, Representative Caezo, distinguished members of the Veteran Legal Affairs Committee. My name is Greg Dougal. I'm representing Hospitality Maine, and I am testifying in favor of LD. 1751, which would make permanent the ability of restaurants and bars to serve beer, wine, and cocktails to go in Maine statute. Uh, from the day that the governor closed restaurants but encouraged them to continue selling takeout with their favorite beverage, Hospitality Maine has been at the table and thankful and appreciative of the efforts by the governor's staff, DAFs, Pablo, and of course, Senator Lucchini and this committee, both in March 2020 and 2021, and today to throw the restaurant industry a lifeline. Excuse me. I believe it bears mentioning that fully two years from the beginning of the pandemic, the virus still rages. Uh, it has taken on different forms, but the devastation is left on the hospitality industry with restaurants specifically will be hard to reverse. Most restaurateurs have modified service in some way and are trying different ways to keep their businesses solvent and viable and beer and wine and cocktails to go are just one of those fixes. In many instances, it has now become a big part of the business model. We honestly believe that issues exacerbated by the virus may not be totally resolved by 2022 when the current allowance for to go ends and that it may last for months and maybe even years. In a poll of hospitality Maine members in July of 2020, 93 of the 117 respondents said that they included beer and wine in the manufacturer's original package as part of their takeout menu, a whopping 80%. And over 50% of those who responded used the cocktails to go feature of this allowance. For this program to end abruptly as the statute sunsets could be devastating to our industry. Regardless of the status of the virus, it will be years before restaurateurs get back to the levels of business they once had. 2021 restaurant sales were only 3% higher in 21 versus 2019, the last normal year. And that was against the backdrop of 8% inflation based on cost of goods and labor over the two years. Hardly a sustainable formula. We conducted a survey again in September of 21 I fully believe that the number of members using this program would have diminished over time. The lack of employees and loss of general interest over time could have surely made it more difficult for restaurants to continue, but that was not the case. 74% were still doing beer and wine and 71% were doing cocktails to go, 20 points higher than when restaurants were shuttered in 2020. When asked if they could continue uh, if they would continue the program this winter, 76% said yes for beer and wine, and 62% said yes to cocktails to go. Thank you, sir. This program is working and has been a lifeline to small businesses in Maine, and for these purposes, we believe that the program should be given permanent status in Maine state statute. Please give us a fighting chance and vote LD 1751 out of your committee ought to pass. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dougal. Perfect timing. As always, any questions? I'm not sure about that, but <laughs> but thank you. Well, you're one for one so far this year, so that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> any questions from the committee for Mr. Dougal? All right, seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony this morning. Thank you, sir. Uh, up next, we'll have Andrew Hickman followed by, uh, I think Mr. McConnell is, I'm not sure if he's still having, uh, uh, no, Mr. McConnell didn't have issues. He'll be next. And then Mr. Roop, if he is available. So uh, Mr. Hackman, when you are ready, sir. Chairman Chiazzo, Senator Lucchini, members of the Bergen Legal Affairs Committee. My name is still Andrew Hackman. I do appreciate uh, Hickman. Uh, would love to be related to, to Senator Hickman, but it is Hackman. So, um, but um, was, that, was that me? If it was, I apologize. Yeah, a lot you, of things going on, lots of screen. No, nope, no, nope, totally get it, and and uh, and appreciate it. <clears throat> but um, representing the Distilled Spirits Council, a, rep, rep, a resident of Union, and uh, we are here in strong support of 1751. We also strongly supported uh, the initial efforts to to create this provision. I just want to note that as as uh, 
uh, Director um, Minio noted, 15 states have made this now permanent, 18 states have created long-term extensions for cocktails to go, and these have been vital uh, methods for the, the restaurant industry to, to stay in business and to continue to operate. Uh, we caution the committee from, from going towards a long-term extension, setting the right date as we all have seen with this pandemic has been tricky at best. And um, as the director noted, um, we've not seen problems uh, with this over the last two years. So we again, strongly support 1751 uh, on behalf of the Distilled Spirits Council, urge the committee vote, vote on to pass, and I will cede the rest of my time in trying to stay the shortest over uh, the three bills today. Uh, I want the shortest time for the three three bills, and that to count against my record. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hackman, and, and again, apologies to you and to Senator Hickman for the confusion. I got a lot of screens going on. So uh, thank you for that uh, very brief but pertinent and poignant testimony. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Uh, up next, we have David McConnell. Uh, and I don't see Mr. Roop still available. Uh, and then we'll go on to Mr. Smith. So Mr. McConnell, uh, when you are ready, sir. Thank you, Representative Chiazzo, Senator Lucchini, and members of the VLA. Um, I'm here today uh, to speak in strong support of LD 1751. Um, it has been, the to-go provision has been a really important uh, lifeline for us uh, and has become an important part of our business. Uh, I am and I should say I'm a, a resident of Falmouth and I am one of the co-founders of Three of Strong Spirits, which is a small distillery in Portland. Um, one of the provisions that has been very important also for us, which I like to think of as the thank you for not requiring us to make our own vermouth provision uh, is a part of the bill that indicates that um, small distilleries can use uh, wine or spirits that they don't themselves manufacture in cocktails, provided they purchase those products from a licensed reseller, um, like Bow Street or RSVP or any of the other uh, states resellers. And um, that has been uh, very, very important for us and very helpful for us as well um, to, um, you know, frankly, to, to remain a viable business and to, uh, to stick around uh, making delicious spirits and cocktails. So I want to just thank, uh, again, thank Senator Lucchini for bringing the legislation forward and for the committee for um, uh, your thoughtful uh, work and support uh, on behalf of, uh, of our industry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Uh, any questions for Mr. McConnell from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Uh, I don't see Mr. Roop uh, in the attendee room or uh, on the panel, so we will move on to uh, Mr. Smith. If you could please uh, state your name, the town you're from, and who you're representing, if anybody, please. Uh, Senator Lucchini, uh, Representative uh, Chiazzo, distinguished, distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you for offering me the opportunity to speak with you today in support of LD 1751. Uh, my name's Bob Smith. I'm the proud proprietor of Sebasco Harbor Resort and live in Phippsburg, Maine. Uh, we operate a seasonal property from May until October, and my wife, Lori, and I spend our winters in Portland. Um, I just finished my 25th year as the owner of the property, and the last two years have certainly been challenging uh, for so many obvious reasons. Um, however, adversity leads to adjustments, uh, which often create opportunities uh, to improve how you operate. Um, it was so beneficial for Maine to recognize the need to help restaurants stay in business when so many customers were restricted from dining inside. Uh, enhancing takeout opportunities helped all of us to, uh, who survived to stay afloat, 
while allowing customers to enjoy great dining experiences and still feel safe. The dining uh, uh, opportunity gets enhanced for many when they have a chance to enjoy the full experience of a cocktail or another alcoholic beverage with their takeout meals. Um, what is unique about Sabasco is that we have all types of accommodations from our original main inn and the lighthouse to a variety of cottages that are spread out over more than 100 acres. Uh, we adjusted quickly to takeout, uh, providing picnic tables, tents all over the resort. Uh, but until the law was changed, our guests couldn't enjoy the full experience with the accompanying beverages that they desired. Um, allowing guests to take that dining experience back to their cottage, uh, suites or rooms certainly seemed to benefit all. Um, our cottages have a dining area, uh, but many don't have the kitchen facilities to prepare food or drink. Uh, allowing our guests the opportunity to enjoy that complete dining experience uh, benefited all of us. Um, we all know that uh, our experience with COVID-19 is not over. Uh, continuing to adjust our businesses so that we can operate to feed customers, provide jobs, and keep the economy moving will be necessary. Um, however, it's been clear that allowing cocktail beverages to be included with takeout orders has not become the safety issue uh, that some had feared. Uh, it makes sense to provide that guest service for everybody's safe enjoyment uh, moving forward on a permanent basis. Um, we've had years of experience with allowing customers to take home and finish open bottles of wine. It has proven to be safe to do so. Gotcha. Um, we hope that, uh, we think it's time to make permanent the same opportunity for other alcoholic beverages that are done in the same way. And I would welcome any questions from the committee. 10 seconds to spare. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Smith. Appreciate the, uh, the, the testimony. Any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none. Thank you, sir, for your time. Thank you. Uh, last, Speaking uh, in favor is uh, David Turin. So Mr. Turin, when you're ready, please, sir, uh, your name, the town you're from, and who you are representing, if anybody. Uh, and sir, sorry, you're on mute. How about now? Perfect. Thank you, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and distinguished members of the Veteran and Legals Affair Committee. My name is David Turin. I live in South Portland and I own David's restaurants in Portland and in South Portland. And I'm favoring, uh, I'm testifying in favor of LD 751. The sale of to-go beer, wine and cocktails was allowed temporarily early on in the pandemic as a way to help bars and restaurants pivot and survive. This practice was and continues to be a lifeline to David's restaurants as well as to other businesses in my industry. It has added not only in direct revenue to our businesses, but it is also generally encouraged to go sales by making us one-stop shops. I'm unaware of any negative unintended consequences, and I'm really hoping that you will pass LD 1751. Uh, thank you very much for considering my testimony and your deliberations. Thank you, Mr. Turing. We are, uh, everybody's very prompt today, which is much appreciated. <laughs> Much appreciated. Any questions for Mr. Turin from the committee? Seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Thanks appreciate very much. Appreciate your time today. Uh, that concludes everybody on the list who is speaking in favor. Um, I don't see anybody on the list speaking in opposition. So we move on to neither for nor against. And I will rep uh, recognize uh, Christine Cummings. And when you are ready, Ms. Cummings, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, Chairman Chiazzo, Senator Lucchini, and members of the Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. Again, my name is Christine Cummings, Executive Director of the Maine Grocers and Food Producers Association. Um, when we provided testimony on LD-205 last February, our comments were specific to the September 2022 sunset date. As an ally of the tourism and hospitality industries, our testimony was based on the temporary allowance to ensure our on-premise partners were able to remain economically viable. 
Grocers, too, continue to experience challenges with their own supply chains, and we are far from understating the impacts of the pandemic on consumer behavior. We express hesitation of the potential advantage that LD 1751 may give restaurants and bars as consumers continue to utilize alcohol to go service with their takeout. We have not yet had an adequate time to review the success, potential pitfalls, or liabilities of the policy. We support an extension of the cocktails and prepackaged alcohol to go with a full order. Additional time to understand the impact of this legislation and our new normal outside of the pandemic will aid in our understanding of what this policy change may mean for all industries. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you, Ms. Cummings. Any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, that concludes uh, those who signed up. Uh, to testify uh, for LD 1751. If there is anybody in the attendee room wishing to testify who has not testified yet, please raise your virtual hand and we will recognize you and bring you into the room. Okay, seeing none, then uh, the public hearing for 1751 is closed. <laughs> Okay, uh, last but certainly not least, we will uh, open the public hearing for LD 1643, which is an act to correct errors, inconsistencies, and conflicts in and to revise the state's liquor laws. And yet again, I will defer to Senator Lucchini, the bill sponsor, to uh, kick us off, and I think that's uh, that's certainly beyond the trifecta. We might even be uh, double hat trick territory this morning. So, yeah. Senator Lucchini, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Representative Chiazzo, members of the committee. This is the last one for me today. Um, I put these in really early. That's why they popped up first. <laughs> as we're wondering, Senator Farron. Um, but I'm, my name's uh, Louis Lucchini. I represent most of Hancock County in the state Senate, and I'm here to present LD 1643 an act to correct errors, inconsistencies, and conflicts in and to revise the state's liquor laws. Um, I guess if you have the copy of it, it's a really large bill um, that actually stems from a committee bill in previous legis legislatures uh, that seeks to clean up Title 28A. I think like many statutes um, that have seen so many changes over years and decades, uh, sometimes the changes produce some unintended conflicts, discrepancies, and other issues. And so this bill uh, tries to clean up a lot of those things. Um, the process for this began back in the 128th legislature by um, the senator who preceded me in my seat, the seat that I have now. Um, and we kind of began by directing OPLA to analyze and identify errors and conflicts and inconsistencies across the title, and then bring them back uh, to the next legislature. I think the 129th to 130, somewhere around there. <laughs> um, so then we, uh, as a legislature last session, um, we carried the bill over so we could spend the summer with a subcommittee. Uh, we put together a subcommittee that spent the summer going through all of the details of the, the title, uh, working closely uh, with uh, Janet, as well as uh, Director Minio, Tim Poole, and Larry Sanborn from Bablo. Um, and the product before you is, is what our committee ultimately voted for um, last session, but because of the early adjournment, we weren't able to um, to get it out. So, uh, okay. So basically, uh, as you go through these, a lot of these changes will seem pretty minor, and some are just wording. Others were things where there was a conflict, where um, something may be included in two areas. And in those situations, nonpartisan staff can't make the decision for us. So we have to come in and, and make the decision on what those were. Um, but really the, the point of this is to make it so that these conflicts are eliminated, which makes it easier for industry participants to understand what regulations they have to follow. And it makes it easier on Bablo um, when they're out there uh, enforcing what's in the law. Uh, when it's duplicative, then it causes issues and delays, which is bad for the industry and bad for Bablo both. So with that, I'll conclude. This is a, is a big one. And obviously, I think timing would matter because it covers virtually every part of the title. It may be something that we um, have.
have to take some time on and then pass at the end after other bills are passed. But Janet, I'm sure can walk us through that procedure during work session where we can try to create as few conflicts as possible. So with that, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Senator Lucchini. Any questions from the committee? Wow, no, not even any comments on the length of the bill, huh? Okay, all right, wow. Must be getting tired or hungry. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. I uh, appreciate your, your, your kicking us off. Um, uh, there are no co-sponsors, however, Senator uh, Sanborn is joining us and I would like to recognize her and give her the opportunity to speak as well. So Senator Sanborn, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, Representative Chiazzo. If it's not a problem, I would love to defer to um, Ms. Trundy or whoever is going to present from Bablo so that you could get the substance of um, what their uh, presentation is before I address it. Absolutely. Yep. We can bring, uh, we can bring in uh, Ms. Trundy. I think she is, uh, she would be next on the list. So let's bring her into the room. Good morning. Good morning, welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to be back with you. Um, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. My name is Anya Trundy, and I'm Chief of Legislative Affairs and Strategic Operations for the Department of Administrative and Financial Services. I am testifying in support of LB 1643. Bablo supported the work of the Title VIII um, A Recodification Subcommittee in 2019 that resulted in this bill. But my primary purpose for today is to bring forth an issue that Bablo encountered this fall and that this bill seems a fitting vehicle to address via amendment. Um, while reviewing alcoholic beverage labels for approval, Bablo staff um, recently raised the question whether based upon the definitions in statute, beers that are produced partially from fermented fruit should be classified as malt liquor, wine, or sparkling wine. Um, this question matters because the excise tax rates for these three liquors differ substantially. Um, 35 cents per gallon for malt liquor, 60 cents per gallon for wine, and $1.24 per gallon for sparkling wine. Historically, Bablo has always approved the label of labels of fruit beers, and given their current popularity, there were already numerous examples of fruit beers on store shelves. Um, I've included the definitions in statute. Um, for malt liquor, sparkling wine, and wine. I will not read them. I'll allow you guys to read them. Um, after conferring with the Office of the Attorney General, it appeared that a beer or other alcoholic beverage that is produced by the fermentation of both malt and fruit satisfied the definitions of both malt liquor and depending upon the carbonation, wine, or sparkling wine. The resulting question was how should such a hybrid liquor be treated for the purposes of imposing the excise tax? At the point that a brewery submits a label to Bablo for approval, that beer is in its final station, stages of being prepared for serving or distribution. Rejection of a label could result in product loss and production backups so as to not cause irreparable harm to Maine's craft brewing industry by holding up the label approvals of fruit beers for the four months until the legislature would reconvene, staffs communicated the following administrative determination to the Brewers Guild via a memo from the commissioner's office to Bablo. With respect to those beers and other malt beverages made partially from fermented fruit, the Department of Administrative and Financial Services recognizes that the brewers had intended them as malt liquor, federal, federal alcohol and tobacco tax and Trade Bureau rulings permit them to be classified as malt beverages, provided that 51% of the fermentable material used in production consists of malt, and three, their primary base ingredient is malt, not fruit, as would be the case for wine or sparkling wine. Therefore, for the purposes of taxation, uh, the Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages and Lottery Operations shall treat as malt liquor any beer or other alcoholic beverage produced by the fermentation of both fruit and malt, so long as malt comprises 51% of the fermentable material used in production and fruit constitutes a secondary ingredient. 
This interpretation maintains consistency with the traditional practice of approving the labels of beers and other malt beverages containing fruit and taxing them as malt liquor. We made a commitment to the Brewers Guild to bring the matter to the VLA committee this session and to seek to clarify the statute so that the definition of malt liquor and wine become mutually exclusive and identified 1643 as a potential vehicle. We hope the committee will amend this bill to address this issue stemming from statutory definitions codified in the late 80s that, don't, that didn't anticipate the innovation in beer that has made Maine a destination for craft brewing enthusiasts and brewing a major industry of the state. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today. I am happy to respond to any questions and will be available to you at the work session. Thank you, Ms. Trendy. Um, a quick, quick question. So does the alcohol content still apply? Obviously, depending on the differences between help, helping differentiate between the malt liquor and the wine or is it strictly just ingredients now? It, it's strictly just ingredients. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, any questions for uh, Ms. Trundy from the committee? Uh, Representative Wood. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Trundy, I I'm just curious why, I'm trying to quickly read the definitions, why is sparkling wine taxed at a, a much higher rate than wine? I don't know the answer for sure, but my guess is that it was a French import. Typically, but that was probably true. <laughs> I think. A long I, time I, I, think ago. It's, I think it's kind. Of, I think it's kind of a a luxury. They would be when the tax rates were originally set. I just think that that has changed a lot. <laughs> as somebody who drinks a lot of sparkling wine, um, but I I was just curious if you knew the background. Thanks. That's my assumption. All right, thank you, Representative Wood. Any other questions for Ms. Trendy? Okay, seeing none, look forward to your participation in the work session as always, and, um, uh, and appreciate the information you're providing for sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, Senator Sanborn, if you are ready, willing, and able, then the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Representative Chiazzo, and uh, thank you to Senator Lucchini and to uh, Ms. Trundy and the folks at Bablo for bringing this issue forward. I am Senator Heather Sanborn. I represent half of Portland and half of Westbrook. And I also, as you all know, own Rising Tide Brewing Company in Portland. Um, I wanted to take a few minutes to testify today um, just because I, I wanna highlight for this committee um, first of all, that I'm very grateful to um, Ms. Trundy and to Bablo uh, for stepping in and providing a stopgap solution, um, a, a very reasonable reading, um, and one that was in accord with the historic practice. Um, but I also just want to highlight for this committee so that they understand the type of disruption to our businesses that's caused when um, labels are rejected in a way that does not accord with historic practice. And um, this came, this issue came forward just completely out of the blue this fall, um, or I guess it was in late summer, um, for um, breweries across the state, where uh, labels that would have been approved in the past have been approved in the past, were suddenly being rejected on a new and novel reading of the statute. One that as you read it, and I'm an attorney, I can read the statute and see where that interpretation came from, but it didn't accord with historic practice. And it was suddenly changed with no opportunity uh, for discussion or input, but instead one particular brewer's labels were rejected and then another, and then another, and then another. And we had to put together a fire drill as an organization, as an industry, in order to respond to this in a period of um, incredible stress on our industry as it relates to the pandemic and as it relates um, to just trying to keep our businesses afloat. Um, it was also during a very busy time of year during our tourist season. So I'm just coming in today to say, I don't think this is a close call at all. It accords with the historic practice that has been in place for decades. Um, and Beers with fruit in them are not a new concept. They're not novel or innovative, actually. 
um, blueberry beer you guys have probably all heard of and um, frankly might have had more of in the 90s than uh, is available today. So there are certainly some different types of uh, fruit beers out there, but the idea that they're close to wine is just not the case. Um, it's very, very clear uh, when a beer is um, has has fruit added. And frankly, we would go out of business if we tried to make beer out of fruit purees because they are incredibly expensive as a source of alcohol um, if you're making it in a beer making process as opposed to a wine making process. So um, I really appreciate the committee's attention today. I do hope in the future that label approvals can go back to being the administrative um, process that they were in the past, as opposed to a substantive review of our recipes or of our business practices in a way that is truly disruptive uh, to our businesses. And I expect more legislation to come forward on this topic in the future sessions um, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sanborn. I, for one, am not going to take the bait on the um, uh, amount of blueberry beer that I drank because I will date myself. So um, suffice to say that I am familiar with the product. <laughs> Any questions from the uh, committee? Uh, Representative Corey. I'm just going to offer up that I don't drink blueberry beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sounds like we're queuing up for a really good work session. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Senator Sanborn while we have her in front of the committee? Okay. Oh, Senator McCrate. Uh, sorry, Representative McCrate. I did gave you a promotion. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Sanborn, this, your testimony was really helpful to understand where, where this, what needs to be fixed. I'm a little fuzzy on how it happened. There was a different process in approving. Is that is that right? I think a there was a change in personnel. Ah, okay, that's what I wondered. And your suggestion is: Does the language that we have in Ms. Trundy's um, testimony cover what you're suggesting about how labels would be approved going it, forward? Uh it, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. It, it covers the issue with regard to the fruit beers, which is, I think, all you have before you appropriately during this emergency session. Um, but there may be a broader issue uh, afoot that uh, we could address in a subsequent session with a standalone piece of legislation that wasn't an errors bill, because I think this fruit issue is truly an error that came to light. Um, but the way in which it came to light points out perhaps a more fundamental problem with the way that uh, our label approval statute is structured at the moment. Great, thank you very much. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Representative McCray. Uh, any other questions for Senator Sanborn? Okay, seeing none, then thank you very much for coming before the committee. We always appreciate hearing from you. All right, we'll move on to the public hearing portion of it, of our, uh, 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 excuse me, the, the four public hearing, speaking for the bill. Uh, and we will start with um, Chris Beeney, followed by uh, David McConnell. And that should be those registered speaking for. So let's see. Let me bring in Mr. Feeney to start. And then bring back Mr. McConnell. So Mr. Feeney, when you are ready, sir, the floor is yours. All right. Um, good afternoon, Senator Lucchini, Representative Cayazzo, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. Uh, my name is Chris Feeney. I'm a resident of New Gloucester. I work in government and public affairs at Bernstein Schur, and I'm here um, today on behalf of the Maine Brewers Guild, which is a nonprofit trade association that represents Maine brewers. Um, we are uh, appreciative and, and supportive of the work that many of you have done for years uh, on LD 1643, but we do ask for one more clarification um, and that is the, the issue that um, Senator Sanborn and, and Anya had brought forward um, so a clarification in the definition of malt liquor uh, in a way that affirms the right for main, main breweries to include 
fruit and other adjunct ingredients in their brews with the applicable, applicable malt liquor tax rates to be imposed to these brews. Um, this would be in line with federal taxation policy for malt liquor which includes ample allowances for fruit and other adjunct ingredients to be included in malt liquor. Um, this change would only serve to provide further clarity for industry participants and regulators. It would not be any substantive change. Um, today's craft beer brewers must innovate to succeed. Uh, and this includes brewing new recipes and getting beer to market in a timely manner. Uh, that is said is worth noting that Maine brewers have been brewing fruited beers for decades and have received international recognition and awards for these brews. Um, a clear definition of malt liquor, which express, expressly permits the rights of main breweries to include these adjunct ingredients without further attestations uh, is necessary and critical. Um, a substantial number of main brewers have had their label approvals delayed due to the perceived lack of clarity in this definition and a failure to act on this issue risks further stifling our industry's ability to compete. Um, we are grateful um, for the Department of Administrative and Financial Services attention to this matter and agree with them uh, that this bill is the best vehicle to resolve this issue. Uh, the Maine Brewers Guild would gladly work with this committee, DAFs and any other parties on discussions to address the issue and appreciate your consideration uh, on this request. Thank you, Mr. Feeney. Uh, appreciate your testimony. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your uh, your testimony this morning. Thank you. Oh, I'm having some funny computer things going on. Uh, and apologies, I did not see Senator Daughtry in the uh, in the waiting room. So. Um, uh, uh, excuse, sorry, Mr. McConnell, I'm going to bring in the Senator next, uh, and I apologize, I did not see her in the waiting room, so, um, bring in Senator Daughtry and see, uh, she is ready. Good morning, Senator, apologies. No worries at all, and I think we're now technically good afternoon. <laughs> I'm still on the on the YouTube, which is a delay. So there we go. Sounds <laughs> good. Well, good afternoon, Representative Piazzo and Senator Lucchini and fellow distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. My name is Maddie Daughtry, and I have the distinct pleasure of representing Senate District 24, which are the communities of Brunswick, Hartswell, North Yarmouth, Freeport, and Palinal, which have many, many different breweries within my Senate district. And I'm also here, most importantly, in my role as co-owner and brewer at Moderation Brewing here in downtown Brunswick. I'm here mostly to echo a lot of what Senator Sanborn so eloquently already said, um, and also um, Chris Feeney representing the Brewers Guild. This is quite possibly one of the most important bills that we've spoken for as far as its impact on our industry in a long time. Um, as was detailed before, this came out of the blue during the height of tourism for many of us as we we're trying to make up from the economic impacts of the pandemic. And out of the blue, we were starting to see labels for beers that were existing. These weren't necessarily new beers start getting denied. Several of my colleagues um, were having you know, new recipes that they weren't out of line uh, according to our you know, local laws. Suddenly they were getting um, rejections on their labels left and right and with no clear reasons. The other thing that was really mystifying about this is some of these beers you know, had already received federal approval and we're getting denied for states. So in that situation, if you're a brewery that you know, has out-of-state distribution, you're left with this position where your beer would technically be allowed to be distributed in say Massachusetts, but your own home state was saying that the label didn't meet classifications. I think another thing when I explain this issue to folks that sort of resonates is when you're discussing about whether it's sparkling wine or not, we are not allowed as brewers under federal law to produce wine in our facilities. It's flat out not a possibility under you know, the rules and regulations that guide us on the federal level. So you know, we can't produce sparkling wine. And I think that's really what it comes down to is just making sure that our state laws 
recognize not only what has been current practice and history, you know, many of these beers, you know, I can think of several ones, you know, from Allagash, from Rising Tide, you know, from my own brewery that, you know, have historically been brewed with fruits that are nothing, nothing new. It's just sort of building on that, you know, tradition. And I think this just really makes sure that our state law is recognizing that this has been the way things have gone. It's current practice, and it also helps us mimic federal law. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I'm going to say, you know, there's a lot of blueberry beers still out there, but definitely a lot less. Um, but I hope you will support this measure and happy to answer any questions or mention a list of fruit beers as well. Thank you, Senator Daughtry. Always looking for new recommendations to get out of the 90s, for sure. Uh, any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you very much for your testimony. Great to see you. Thank you. Likewise. Okay, um, I think next up we have David McConnell. So thank you, sir, for your patience. Uh, apologizing for bumping you to the end. I appreciate your patience. No worries. Thank you, Representative Chiazzo and Senator Lucchini and members of the committee. Um, I'm here to testify in favor of the bill. Um, it has been, as, as Senator Lucchini mentioned, a, a very long process. Sorry, sorry, um, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but if you could, again, just because it's a new public hearing, if you could just state your name where you're oh, from. Oh, thank you. Thank please. you for thank the you. reminder. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm David McConnell. I am a resident of Falmouth, and I am here speaking today on behalf of Three of Strong Spirits, which is uh, holds a small Maine distiller's license in Portland. Um, I'm here in favor of the bill. It's been a long, uh, a, a Herculean work really um, with uh, an incredible amount of labor put in by the folks at Opla, by Janet and Sam and um, uh, Bablo and, and many, many, uh, and of course, uh, both former and present members of this committee. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, and I also just wanted to comment briefly because uh, Representative Wood perhaps unwittingly gave me an opportunity to, to uh, with your question about uh, the difference between taxation and why would it be different for sparkling wine? Well, uh, and I'll keep my rant very short, but I've always been confused, frankly, about the policy distinctions to be made both in terms of tax and elsewhere in the law between um, wine, beer, cider, and spirits that we make. Um, I, 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 you know, it's been mystifying to me, and thankfully, I think we've made progress um, as uh, both federally and here in the state of Maine in um, eliminating some of those what to me feel like arbitrary distinctions um, over the years. And I look forward to continuing to trying to make it as level a playing field as we can for all of us uh, small businesses trying to make a go here in the great state of Maine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none. Thank you again, sir, for your testimony this, this afternoon. I appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thank you. So that concludes everybody on the pre-registration list speaking for. Uh, there is nobody listed speaking uh, against, so we'll move to neither for nor against. And I will recognize Mr. Hackman. And uh, hopefully he will keep his streak going. Uh, and he's, he's running first, second, and third in terms of timing. So. I appreciate that, sir. The floor is yours when you are ready. Uh, thank you, Chairman Chiazzo. Again, Senator Lucchini, members of the VLA committee. My name is again Andrew Hackman, representing Distilled Spirits Council, still a resident of Union, Maine. Uh, testifying neither for nor against on 1643, largely because uh, we know there's been incredible work that's gone into this 101-page this bill. We, we applaud Janet and Sam for their work on this. Um, as the committee works through other legislation this year, you'll recall LD 1358, is legislation that we worked on with Senator Stewart as it relates to the direct sale of, of spirits. Um, we've done a lot of work on that. And as 
1643 moves forward, there are some elements that may relate to that legislation in the future that may need to be addressed, perhaps in, in that legislation, if the committee deems that is something uh, that we want to move forward on. So again, we're supportive of the hard work that's gone into 1643 and just look forward to con continued discussions uh, committee on uh, spirits issues as, as they continue to be addressed this session. So again, appreciate the time. I will try to keep it, again, just as, as coincidentally short and uh, hope everybody has a good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Hackman. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time today. So that concludes uh, the list of people who are pre-registered to speak. If there is anybody in the attendee room who wishes to speak on LD 1643 that has not spoken yet, please raise your virtual hand and we will bring you into the room. Okay, seeing none, then this will conclude uh, the public hearing for LD 1643 and the hearing is closed. So that concludes our list of uh, public hearings for the day. Uh, I will turn it over to uh, the, the, the distinguished chair, Senator Lucchini, with one request for a bio break before we do anything because I have not had the chance to move away from the screen yet and am in desperate need of one. So um, if we do move to work session, I'm gonna have to take a little break. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Senator Lucchini. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Chairman Chiazzo. Yeah, so, <laughs> Uh, I think that's a good idea. We'll take just a quick break for people to get up, stretch out, grab a little bite, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and then come back. Really, we just have on the schedule um, one work session, and uh, Janet's just going to walk us through a couple of tasks uh, or BLA uh, issues for the second regular session. Um, so yeah, let's just take a quick break, in the, and uh, we'll come back, and, and if anybody has any questions or anything, we can take those now too, before we head out. So 12.45 return? Yeah, yeah, is that, is that good with people? Okay, so we'll just take a quick break and then we'll return at 12.45 uh, and, and finish up. Okay, thank you. Same link if you log out, the same link will bring you back.
All right, we'll get restarted in just a couple minutes once we get uh, more members in the Zoom. Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, we'll, after a quick break, we'll resume our uh, committee's work. And next on the agenda, we have a work session. So I'll open the work session on LD 451, an act to remove the party designation from return envelopes for absentee ballots for the general election. Um, so this is a bill, if you remember, we had a couple on the same topic. Uh, we merged into one bill uh, with multiple things that impacted the CDR and had fiscal notes. And we were able to get that put into the budget. So the changes in this bill um, are put in, were put into law through the budget, um, although they won't be effective, I believe, until uh, 2023. Is that right, Janet? I know, I think Janet shared with us the um, yes, that's right. Um, you don't really um, need me to go through all the memo, but I just want to remind everybody how to find all of the materials, just because it has been a little bit of time. So if you will indulge me for a few seconds, I'll remind you how to find everything online, because I had to remind myself, and I added a few more bookmarks to my um, web browser because of it. So here we'll go. This is the home screen for legislature's webpage. Can you all see it? Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I had a weird message for me. And if you remember, if you wanna find all things VLA, you can click on committees up here at the top or here in the middle, the big committees button. And you should never ever forget that VLA is the best for last on the bottom here. You click on that and this is our home page. If you ever want to look at it again, it'll remind you the hearings or the work sessions that are coming up. You can always click to the bill titles, actually the bill text right here. You can see all of your lovely names down here and your addresses if you wanna send each other mail. Um, I don't really have my home address here, but you can send me mail at the office or email me here. You can see um, the weekly schedule is always here in case you forgot it, but it's kind of post it up here, so I don't know why you'd want to download it again. Um, but the most important thing, if you're watching live, then you already know that you clicked here on YouTube to get to the YouTube link, because we are still using that application and all our meetings are being broadcast and recorded, so you can access them later. You can also just listen to the audio if you don't like seeing my terrible picture, which I would understand. Or you can click on committee materials to be brought to all of the information that's been posted online. So on this committee materials page is a whole bunch of information. All of the reports we've received are linked here that our researcher helps us with. She does an excellent job of making sure that all gets to you and gets to the law library. So there's an archive. There's some orientation materials, one of which I'm gonna go over in a minute after the work session, but then committee me meeting materials by LD. And then here we have every LD listed in numerical order as soon as it is has a public hearing assigned because all of the information and the materials are listed by public hearing date. It's a weird system. So instead of requiring you all to remember what's the public hearing date that we had each bill, we just put them in numeric order and bring you to it. So you don't have to worry about remembering that, which I greatly appreciate because I can't remember all of that. So here is the public hearing materials page for LD 451, which we're having the work session on. And you can see by submission date, you could sort it by that date. And then the most recent thing will come on top. 
or it should. There we go, I had it the wrong order. You could sort it by name or anything else. And all the public hearing testimony, the people who signed up to testify is here. And then also the carryover update memo is here. So this is just the memo I wrote to you just to remind you of the bill. If you click on anything in blue, it should be hyperlinked. Let's see if it worked. Yep, so you can get right to the bill text here. Just a reminder that the blues are all hyperlinked. Um, as Senator Lucchini said, there was LD-451 and LD-456. They were exactly identical word for word. They just had different sponsors. A majority of the committee um, voted to incorporate the contents of LD-451, which was the prohibition on including the party designation of an absentee voter on the return envelope for the general election. A majority of the committee voted to include that in LD-148, which was the speaker's bill about ongoing absentee voting. Um, you may or may not recall that that was amended also, so it wouldn't apply to everybody, but only certain categories of individuals. Then that went and it was parked on the special appropriations table. At the same time, it was included as part U, 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 those always like make me laugh, of the budget. And if you were to click on this, you would be brought to the budget. You'd have to scroll down to part U, 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 but instead of making you do that, I just compared here the text of 451 and then the part of the budget, and you can see the exact same changes were made to prohibit the Secretary of State when it makes the return envelopes and designs them from including any kind of party designation or mark for the political party on the return envelope for the general election. And then down here, this is the section of law talking about the clerk actually, actually issuing the absentee ballot and the prohibition on them making any mark on the the envelope or including any designation of the political party for the general election was carried over into the budget, but there was some other language to talk about the ongoing absentee voting because that was also included in the budget. The only difference as Senator Lucchini pointed out earlier is that the bill LD 451 would have been effective 90 days after adjournment of the legislative session in which it's approved. And instead, um, the majority of the committee that amended LD 148 and then the Appropriations Committee, when they added it to the budget, made it effective November 1st, 2023, because as you may recall, the Secretary of State's office is undergoing an RFP process to get a new central voter registration system. And instead, they asked that instead of incurring the programming costs to create a new system that would print different um, labels that would go on the general election ballot versus the primary election ballots, they asked that you consider just making it part of the new central voter registration system that they purchased the requirement that there be different barcode labels so that there won't be a party designation on the general election ballot. And that was approved by this committee and then through the budget process so that the effective date was November 1st, 2023. Thank you, Janet. Um, that's really helpful. And I think this bill like any of the other ones that would have incurred a programming cost to the CVR, we just pushed off till we get the new CVR so that we don't pay for it twice and it just gets implemented into the new RFP uh, version. Is it? Um, and I think we, uh, so we, <laughs> we passed one bill which went to the table, it's still there. We killed one bill and we carried one over just in case uh, it didn't get included into the budget, so. Um, the thoughts here are since we've incorporated this into law, we can dispose of this bill if people are supportive of that, or we can uh, discuss op other options as well. So I don't know what the committee's thoughts are on this one. Uh, Senator Hickman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move ought not to pass on LD 451. Uh, so we have a motion of ought not to pass on LD 451. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so motion of ought not to pass by Senator Hickman and seconded by Representative McRae. Uh, other discussion? Seeing none, uh, Representative Kinney. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, where do we stand on the new ERIC system? Uh, is that going to 
actually be in place for 23 or are we still gonna be having delays put into place? Um, Do we have anyone from the Secretary of State's office that could possibly answer that? I don't see anybody from the Secretary of State's <coughs> office in the waiting room. Um, in terms of the ERIC program, I think we would be getting a membership into a um, into that, uh, I guess that program, which would be different than the CVR um, uh, programming changes. But I, we can ask the Secretary of State just for an update on if if they had the funding, because they may have gotten the funding to um, already and get a membership. I think it's a annual membership fee uh, for that, but we can certainly check with them on that. I don't see anybody. There. Oh, uh, Janet, sorry. I did notice they had a press release a while ago that we have joined Eric. And um, although the provisions of this bill about the um, mark on the absentee ballot return envelope were effective November 1st, 2023, that, did, that effective date did not apply to the Eric portion. So I could double check if you want me to call it up right now, when that was effective, but I do believe I've seen a press release already. I can't remember from what date, right on the Secretary of State's website that we already joined, Eric. Yeah. So would that mean that the new program, it would, where we're in the new program that we've already put in that there wouldn't be no party designation on general ballots? Um, well, so oh. Eric is different. Eric is, um, sorry, I'm trying to get you all back. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just linked in the side. I found that press release after Janet mentioned it. I Googled it, um, but yeah. yeah. So Eric is about, uh, it's a group of member states that share registration information to help clean up the rolls. It doesn't have anything to do. So it does have to do with the central voter registration system in the sense that you input that information in to take maybe somebody off the rolls who's already registered in another state since they registered in Maine. So they would go through that cleaning process, but it doesn't affect how the ballots um, barcode labels are then printed out. I don't know, I'm not an expert at the CVR system. I don't know if that just didn't require programming changes because it's more of a data entry function, but maybe it is more of a programming function. I really don't know. That would be something Secretary of State's office would have to answer for you. Right, yeah, the um, Eric doesn't um, give us the software to write the absentee ballots like Janet said, or the envelopes that <clears throat> goes through our um, CVR. So taking off the party label would be something the new CVR would have to do, or we'd have to reprogram the current one. So it's, it's a different thing from Eric. Um, Eric will help uh, clean up our voter, make sure our voter rolls are clean and everything. Uh, Representative Kinney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm, I'm confused because the CVR, we can't do it with the CVR. So we're getting a whole new CVR, but it has nothing to do with Eric. I guess I'm, I'm, kind of at a loss because this was something that was really important to a lot of members of my caucus. And if it's not going to go into effect till 2023, I'm not sure I can support the current motion. Sure, yeah. Um, so I guess uh, Representative Corey, did you want to address that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Eric doesn't really have anything to do with the new software that the, or the new CVR. Like, Eric is its own sort of standalone thing where states share information about who's moved into those states and who's moved away from those states in order to, you know, clean up voter lists. So, you know, it's essentially kind of a collaborative. If you go on Eric's um, website, there's, you know, a list of, of member states. So that's just kind of one, one element in there. <clears throat> the CVR, I mean, that's our central you know, voter registry, certainly, you know, that that should inform, right? Like, um, or Eric should inform, inform that, you know, hopefully even, even the current, you know, CVR should be able to be informed by Eric. I don't know when we're going to start to share and get that data though, but certainly that should be built into, you know, the next, the next CVR. So, I mean, my, my hopes would definitely be that, you know, if in fact we are, you know, enrolled in Eric soon, that, um, 
you know, that's, that's used to inform, you know, the current, the current database. I mean, I, I think that that should be easy enough. I think that some of the elements that, you know, we were looking at with the future CVR would have been like, you know, the ongoing um, voter registration that we voted on last session, or I know that they put online voter registration. And even though I disagreed with that, that's, that would end up becoming a component, you know what I mean? Or something that they would build into the new CVR, not, not the CVR, but I just think that um, Eric is, Eric is different. Eric, I think is, you know, meant, meant to inform, you know, essentially the database itself or the list of, of names in the database, as opposed to, you know, being a, um, how can I, how can I say this, a software module, you know, that, that they would be adding. And I think module is probably the best word. So, you know, when I use the term module, I think that, and, you know, I'm hoping the Secretary of State's office can somehow join in and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you know, a module would be things like, you know, online voter registration or, um, you know, adding, you know, information like signatures, you know, in there so that clerks can, you know, get get those those signatures or, you know, whether or not somebody's returned an online um, on a ballot, you know, or, or not, you know, if they've got ongoing voter voter registration. So I think I think those are what probably the more module pieces are instead of something that just should influence the data. Thanks. Yeah, I think that that's helpful. And I, I think it does important things, like you said, Representative Corey, like checking other states, they cross check, I think the social security death records and things like that to make sure that voter files are up to date. But the, the CVR really is the, the main system and managed by clerks enter stuff into that. Representative Chiazzo. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Janet, I wanna make sure I understand it um, uh, correctly, which I, 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 I hope I do. We as a committee agreed that um, we would remove the, the party designations from envelopes. We supported that, we passed it, we included it in the budget. Um, we kept this mechanism, we kept this bill as a mechanism in the event that the budget either failed or it didn't make it into the final budget, but it did make it into the final budget. And so now it will become law. <clears throat> it will become law once it comes off the appropriations table. Is that, is that correct? Well, we've already passed the budget, so it's already law. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Sorry but Janet, if you want yep. to. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I understand. I'm just, I'm just trying to get clarification on we're not, we're not, it's going to happen. The question is, is, is when, right? Right. So this um, party designation piece is effective November first, twenty twenty three, but it was this the contents of this bill, which did not include Eric, were included in the ongoing absentee voting bill, which is LD one forty eight. As part of that ongoing absentee voting bill, there were concerns raised about the the integrity of the voter rolls. So the majority committee amendment to LD 148 included the requirement to join Eric as sort of a, if you want to have ongoing absentee voting, we would like you to have clean voter rolls as well. So then um, when it was- that, uh, sorry, sorry, and that was accomplished, right? So according to the secretary, we've, we have entered into that program. Uh, yeah, the press release in October of last year, which sounds funny since it's so newly 2022, but Recently in October, um, the press release says that Maine has joined ERIC and the requirement to do so would have been effective January 1st, 2023. So they did it a little bit early and none of the part, none of the other parts of LD 148. So the ongoing absentee voting or this piece that we added here, the requirement not to include the party designation, none of those take effect till November. So the idea was through your committee amendment, require joining Eric first for a while and then do ongoing absentee voting after hopefully, I don't know how the timing works because I'm not the expert on Eric, but hopefully after some of the cleaning has occurred. So okay. that requirement does exist and we have joined. I don't know if any cleaning of the voter rolls has occurred. Um, I did send a quick email to Secretary Bellows and Deputy Secretary Flynn, but I don't know how busy they are, if they can pop on or not. So I, and I appreciate that clarity. So it, it, I think it, it, 
if, if we're talking in terms of the envelopes themselves, uh, even if we were to push this forward, there's no guarantee it's going to happen sooner because it would require a reprogramming of the current CVR, which would be, um, if I recall from Secretary Bellows' uh, uh, testimony, would, would probably be costly and, and time consuming. So I don't know if we would really gain anything um, by having it a standalone and, and implementing it into the current one versus waiting for the new one to come out and make sure that by statute that's incorporated into the requirements from it. But, but that's just my, that's, that's, I, I, if that's incorrect, then I'll, I'll, <laughs> I will stand corrected. Well, I, I, I do think it's important to know that this will happen. It's going to happen. Um, and we passed the law so that it would happen because I think it's the best practice to not have that on the envelope. And I think it's important as well as those other elements were important too, but in order to get it funded off the, the in, or into the budget, we had to move it out a little bit. So Senator Hickman. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just trying to understand Representative Kenny's opposition to the motion, it would seem that say we passed this bill, it would go into effect 90 days after we adjourned and it still wouldn't be implemented until the CVR was reprogrammed, which the Office of the Secretary of State has made clear they're not going to do. So the only general election that would even apply would be 2022, but it wouldn't apply because the Office of the Secretary of State won't be re reprogramming the CVR to meet this particular bill's provisions. That's how I understand it. So it seems to me that there's no purpose for this bill, except for maybe to, I don't know, honor a commitment to folks that this should happen. But the committee seems to already have said it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when it's implemented. So I guess I don't understand the opposition to the motion from Representative Kinney. Uh, Representative Kinney. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was concerned because I, I knew that we had put some other things into place and I'm hearing that even those other things like the ongoing absentee ballots that were, I believe we said 65 and up and you had to return your ballot or you would no longer get the ongoing and um, things like that. So it's my understanding from what Janet's saying is those things also don't go into effect until November 1st, 2023. Is that correct? Okay. I was speaking and to Senator Hickman's point, I was speaking with the sponsor of this bill this morning, um, who was very concerned because had not heard that it was in the budget, but um, I do remember it going in the budget because it did go through from here. And so I was, um, I didn't have a problem with it until she brought up the, the issue that she thought that it hadn't gone through. So I just wanted to make sure that the other things we put through are still, are also on that same delay. So I appreciate that information. Great, thanks. Um, Representative Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that kind of an issue I, I feel is sort of happening here is I feel like we're getting caught up in the minutia of, of when sort of the Secretary of State is telling us that they can use um, the new CVR in order to not have somebody's, you know, party affiliation on the outside of their absentee ballot like I literally just went to Amazon and I can buy a two pack of Sharpies for a dollar 84 right you spread that out across the 400 and what 92 municipalities across the the state and you know maybe we're talking about five hundred dollars to remove the party affiliation from the outside of an envelope upon mailing an absentee ballot which all have to be stuffed in an envelope licked, steeled with another envelope and, and put in the mail. So, I mean, you know, we, we sitting here talking about, um, you know, voter, voter privacy, which is, is the concern here. And we're saying that we can't possibly solve this solution or find a solution for this until 2023 when um, the, the Secretary of State um, updates, updates the CVR. I just I just don't understand why, you know, we can't have in the interim clerks take a Sharpie and just cross out one little letter on each absentee envelope as it is sent out to the voters so that they do not know what the party affiliation of the person returning it is. So 
Um, somebody may think that's too difficult. I, I think that's a very basic, basic task. Like I said, the fiscal note on this can't be much. I'm guessing less than less than a thousand bucks. I don't I don't know. You know, given the price of Sharpie markers, um, and that's that's for a two pack. I mean, you start buying multi packs, and these things become super super inexpensive and super super cheap. Anyways, um, you know, are we interested in the integrity of the vote? Are we interested in how long it takes? to, you know, implement something into the, um, the CV, the CVR, the new CVR, that's just kind of where my head is at and, you know, why I may be think rethinking this bill a little bit. Thank you. Representative Chiazzo. Oh, I think you're on mute, uh, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's been a long morning. So, um, I'm, it strikes me, uh, we, we like to watch a show here at our house called Ancient Aliens. And the reason I bring that up is because uh, the supposition for most of those shows is uh, a premise that there's uh, an obvious simple solution or there's something that's pretty obvious. And then the rest of the argument is based on that supposition, even if the supposition is inaccurate. So as, as a as someone who's, who does business processes and procedures, um, I, I, there's all kinds of challenges, I think, and simplifying it with saying a Sharpie is the solution, I think is, while I give Representative Corey credit for thinking outside the box, I, I think there are just so many opportunities for errors and omissions and conflicts that are associated with that, that, you know, to, to, to implement the will of the committee and do it in a in a cost effective way for the for the citizens of Maine, and basically doing it in a way that that meets the expectations that were put before us in terms of providing their privacy, I think is probably the right approach. Uh, and the reason I say that is because um, it's going to happen. It's passed. Uh, the question, really, I think now we're getting into is it going to happen fast enough, and what are the outcomes going to be if it doesn't happen fast enough? Okay. Um, we've had this system for a while. Um, it was a surprise, or I shouldn't say surprise, it was new information to some of us, and we've been doing it for a long time. So I think waiting, uh, you know, a few months in, in order for, this, for the Secretary of State to get a system in place that makes sense economically and, and uh, efficiently, and also will take any, any type of interpretation out of the mix whatsoever. It's black and white, it's on or it's off. Um, I, I think that's really uh, Im important for us to take into consideration. And, and, and I, if we're just arguing about not whether it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen, I, I would advocate for taking the time and doing it right. Because if there's one thing we prove in Augusta, we never have enough time to do it right, but we always seem to have time to do it again. So I'd like to do it right the first time. Um, and, and I will support the motion because again, I think this particular vehicle it has no purpose any longer. It, we, we, we've addressed all of the needs with that in other areas. And I think we're just really now into the minutia of, is it gonna happen fast enough for our, for our liking? So, so I'll support the motion. Um, and again, I, I very much appreciate Patrick Corey's, <laughs> Senator Representative Corey's thinking outside the box. Um, there's all kinds of different ways to skin a cat. I just think that like everything we do, there's unintended consequences and we pull on a string somewhere and the sweater's gonna unravel someplace else. So. Sure, thanks. And just, I know it's been a while since we've <laughs> done this stuff and, um, you know, just to, to go back to our committee deliberations previously, you know, I think everybody agreed that this should happen. If we're going to do it the professional and right way that you conduct an election, you reprogram CVR and it's done in that manner and realizing it would require an appropriation, we decided and agreed to bundle a bunch of things together and then carry this over in case it didn't get funded. And that was the agreement. I wouldn't have probably voted to carry this over if we hadn't done that. Um, we funded it, which was, it's never easy to fund a bill, but we did. And it's just simply got a delayed effective date, much like the rest of the bill, which was important to other people. Um, so that's just kind of the, the background of what kind of got us here. Um, I think, it's best practice to not have that on the envelope, but we would have had to pay to reprogram a computer system that we're going to pay to replace, you know, a month or two later, which would not be effective use of tax dollars. Uh, Senator Heckman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with all of that. I agree with all of what Representative Kiazzo has said. The bill's not necessary. But if I entertain what Representative Corey is also saying, the committee could write a letter to the Secretary of State's office and ask for that to be the case. But here's why I wouldn't vote for that either. The absentee ballot's integrity, even with this improper information on it for a general election, is such that there should be no stray marks on the envelope lest they be disqualified from being counted. And so having a Sharpie take something off of the return address or any other part of the envelope could flag it for any person who is saying this ballot has been tainted. The only thing that's supposed to be on the outside of a ballot is the signature of the person who is voting. And so I just think we should dispense with this bill. And I humbly request that we just dispense with this bill and take a vote. Thank you. Uh, Representative Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So to start with, this wouldn't be on the outside of, this wouldn't be on the ballot. It would be on the, the interior envelope um, that gets returned to them with the ballot actually inside of it. So that, you know, anybody sorting those those ballots while in their envelopes would know what the party affiliation of, of a particular voter is. And that's where the concern here is. Um, Though I don't watch ancient aliens like like my wife does, I am going to say intelligent life probably exists on distant planets in our in our universe. Um, I am going to push back a little bit. If I have a leak in my roof, right, and say I can't afford, you know, to go and fix that leak in my roof, right? I don't continue to let the water pour into my house. I get up there and I hammer down a tarp. <laughs> And, and fix that until I can get somebody out there to actually fix the problem. Like I said, this is about the integrity of the vote. We're coming up, you know, on um, an election in 2022. We don't know if this is going to be solved or not. Um, people, you know, wrongly or rightly have, you know, complained about the integrity of the vote and the last year, I'm not going to weigh in on that. But what I really want to see is I want to see voter confidence. So for me, marking um, a letter off of, you know, an envelope really, really has nothing to, you know, do with whether or not that vote will actually be counted. It has other information about that voter that's on that, that label. Um, and, you know, that way they can be assured that, you know, nobody knows if it's a Republican or a Democrat or an unenrolled or a Green casting a ballot prior to that ballot actually being put into a machine. Anyways, thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Representative Kinney. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a feeling that was the case. I thought I saw you say something. <laughs> um, I, uh, while I appreciate Representative Corey's comment about a, a Sharpie, and probably most of our town offices even have them already in stock, um, I use Sharpies in my business all the time. And you can still see through um, what's behind it. It's So I'm not convinced that that's necessarily what needs to happen. But I think what I would like to see, and, and I'm going to certainly do this, is push and promote the fact that we did pass this. This is going to happen. We're trying to do it in the most fiscally responsible way. And um, where there were a lot of concerns, I know I had heard a lot of concerns regarding ongoing absentee ballots and how that goes. And the fact that that also being something that people really wanted to see continue and happen, I think that knowing that that too is something that is stalled until we get the new system up and running. Um, I very much appreciate the, the debate that we're having at this point. And that's part of why we have work sessions to iron out these, these little things that we have questions about. Um, and it has been a little while. We're getting back into the swing of things. That's been the subject of the day. That's been the comment everybody's been making all day long. And so I, I think that having this conversation is important because we need to make sure that we are having these conversations and making sure that all sides are being represented. And for myself personally, my questions have been addressed. And so I 
as, as much as I'd like to see this happen in time for the, the upcoming election, um, we've been using the system for a while. And maybe if people are really concerned that their ballot is going to be lost or whatever, because they have a, a theory that their, their office is going to somehow not follow the law when it comes to an, an absentee ballot, then they'll make arrangements to vote on election day instead. And I think that that's what we need to promote. If you really are that concerned about an absentee ballot, then vote on election day. Thanks, uh, Representative Kinney. Uh, Representative Corey. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I mean, I can I can possibly go with that. You know, I, you know, I think that maybe maybe I might be being a little bit of a revisionist here, but I'd be really curious to find out from the Secretary of State's office what it would have taken to remove that little party designation from that level or from that from that label that goes on the envelope within the current CV. Are is is that something that would have been an hour of programming, two hours of programming? Would that have created the need to totally redo the CVR, which we were going to do anyways? I don't think that we ever sort of asked that question. So while, you know, I'll probably, you know, go, go with that vote on this, I still think that there's a lot of questions to be answered that, that we just don't have, you know, good, good answers, answers for. So I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll likely support, you know, this motion to, um, kill this bill since it's going to be happening. But we really do need to be concerned about voter integrity and, you know, whether or not people, you know, feel that their votes are being being counted and everything else. So I'll support the motion, but I don't know. I think we can do better. Thanks. Okay, any uh, further discussion? Okay, seeing none. Uh... We have a motion before us of ought not to pass. It was made by Senator Hickman and seconded by Representative McCrate. Um, Karen, can you please call the roll? Sorry about that. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Yes. Senator Farron, yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Representative Tuttle, absent. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Riley, yes. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Reluctantly, yes. Representative Corey, yes. Representative Dolliff. Representative Dolliff. Absent. Mr. Chair, 10 in favor of the motion, zero opposed to the motion, and three members absent. Okay, thank you, uh, Karen. All right, so with that, we'll close the work session on LD 451. And lastly, we just have a couple of uh, things that Janet was going to run over uh, for the committee's information. Um, for the session coming ahead. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I forget how much time it takes to record all of those things. I thank you for your patience. So if you see here, I'm gonna try and zoom in a little. There we go. Um, on the VLA materials page, which hopefully you remember how to get to since I just showed you. Um, if you click on the orientation materials at the top, 
there are two bullet points that are a little bit separated. Those are the new things um, for this session. And we're gonna talk really quickly about the top item, which is a memo put together for you by Okla. I might have met the person who wrote, wrote it, but if you don't like it, I never met her. Um, so the top gives you all of our dates and deadlines and statutory adjournment is Wednesday, April 20th. That's when um, I turn into a pumpkin and you can't ask me any more questions ever again. Just kidding, I will still be here. So um, as you can see, there are some pretty ambitious timelines that um, have been put forth by the presiding officers and we usually try and meet them. I don't know how the chairs do it, but they try and race through everything. So as you know, we had six carryover bills that are all listed here. Um, the highlighting for the public hearing is just a link to bring you to that page that I showed you that has all the testimony and any bill analyses or anything else that was provided before, just so you can find it really quickly. And then the left-hand link will show you the actual text of the bill that was carried over. So there are six of those. One of those we heard today, which was the um, long Title 28A bill. And then one of those we just took care of in a work session. There's already been 16 bills referred to VLA. And as you can see, there's a hearing date already for many of them, um, but they're all listed here. And again, if you click on the left, left you can see the um, text of the bill. There were several other bills that if we look at the titles, either submitted by departments or submitted by legislators and approved by the Legislative Council, we would guess that they might come to us, but there's no guarantee. And these are the titles as they were submitted by the legislators. As you know, when you submit your own bills, when it goes through the drafting process, sometimes the revisor's office suggests a change to the title. So the title that eventually comes out at the other end may look slightly different, but these are the ones we're still waiting for. Um, I just put a note here because this may actually affect this committee. In addition to the bills that have already been listed on this memo, you, if there are any major substantive rules that are gonna be fired, filed, excuse me, not fired. <laughs> the deadline for those to be submitted is January 14th. That's the legislative acceptance period. Um, and if you have any that are submitted by then, you'll hear the implications of them being filed on time versus not being filed on time. The governor also has the ability to submit bills at any time. And then if there are any after deadline bill requests, either by legislators or by agencies that submit late filed major substantive rules, those could be headed your way if the Legislative Council lets them in and they're referred here. Um, there are several bills from this committee that are on the uh, appropriations table still, including this ongoing absentee voting bill we just talked about that's also in the budget. There was another bill that had part funding in the ARPA bill that was enacted last year. So that information's here for you. And then there are two bills that I've never seen this before, although I haven't been here that long that didn't actually get passed in the house, but are still on the special appropriations table. I thought that was pretty interesting myself. So then there's several other types of things that might come before you. The first is a report that I didn't realize this is on me. Um, well, not a report really, a review by April 1st of last year, but you can do it late. It's still okay, better late than never to review a statute about the establishment of the Vietnam War Remembrance Day. So you can conduct that at any time. The chairs will probably schedule that at some time. Or if you haven't seen it, just contact Sam or myself. Sam will probably handle that. Um, I should back up and say that, as you know, I've been the primary staff for BLA for a couple of years now. Um, we had somebody leave our office very, very recently, late in December. Um, she was purloined by an agency that wanted her. So, um, <laughs> I have been asked to help out in the Judiciary Committee on um, probate bills and Indian law bills. And as you know, those are not complicated in the least. So that won't take any of my time. And as a result, Sam has stepped up and he will be handling all of the veterans bills. He's handled some of them last session and then some of the gambling bills as well. And we'll just sort of switch some things around. Um, but I don't like leaving VLA, so it's very hard for me, but I will be here as much as I can. Then there are, four um, laws that have been enacted. They are on the books, but they have some sunset provisions, two of them. The bottom two were the subject of LD 1751's hearing this morning. There's another one which wasn't enacted in statute, but it was um, 
passed an unallocated law, which waived some requirements for um, license renewal for certain retail licenses. And that has expired, but you could always reenact it if you wanted to. So that's listed here for you to remember. And then there's one provision of the marijuana law that had a statutory repeal date of January 1st of this year. Um, I don't know anything about marijuana, so don't ask me, ask Sam. Um, nobody laughed that time. <laughs> I try and see if anybody's laughing at me. Um, then there are a whole bunch of reports, six one-time reports, and I think it's 16 um, that are annual reports. And these are reports that are due to you either because you asked for them by letter, which is the case in this second one down here, or because they are required by law to be submitted to you. And we've given you a link to the law that requires the report if it's there, or in this case, a link to the bill um, that led to the letter that you sent. And these are reports coming to you. You can see the day that they're due on the left-hand side. Um, and you can have those scheduled if you want to for presentations, you would speak to the chairs about that because they're in charge of the schedule. And if um, anyone wants to have the authority to report out a bill from the committee related to these reports, most of them do, we will mention, say that there's explicit authority to report out legislation. I have an argument up my sleeve that I think can work for any of these reports for you to have the authority to report out legislation other than this one that's based on a letter you sent. I think we can have an argument to allow you to report out legislation for any of these reports. I'm willing to try it with the revisor's office if you want to. Um, so just keep in mind and be on the lookout for these reports. These are all posted online once we receive them. For example, we have received the University of Maine Systems report about its use of slot machine money. They sent it in early, even though it's due February 15th. So if you click on that, you'll find that report linked right there. Obviously, the other reports that haven't been submitted yet aren't linked to this memo, but I do want to show you that whenever you do get reports, if you go back to the VLA's homepage, you can see this reports received. This is where our researcher helps us. I email it to her and she makes it appear here miraculously online for you. So I appreciate that very much from her. Um, and then the last thing I wanna go over at the bottom here, I did mention, sorry, there's two more things. It's not last, I lied. Um, first of all, there's the Government Evaluation Act. If you sit on more than one committee or you've been on other committees in the past, you know that the legislature, one of its oversight functions of the executive branch is to review reports that are periodically submitted for each agency. And we do not have any to review this year. So that's good news as far as scheduling is concerned. But I will note that the um, statutes provide that the HHS, HHS committee would review um, the Office of Marijuana Policy to the extent it has jurisdiction over the main Medical Use of Marijuana Act. And then the state and local government committee is supposed to review, um, again, OMP as well. And those two things don't make sense to me. So you could ask the state and local government committee when it, I think it's gonna have a bill to review sort of the language of the Government Evaluation Act this year, or at least that's a rumor I heard. You could ask them to correct this and make this a VLA responsibility, unless you don't want anything to do with it, in which case we can just be quiet. Um, Again, no laughing, this is very sad. Um, so then the last thing I did wanna point out to you, this is something that's buried in um, Title V, um, Chapter 375, the Administrative Procedures Act, which is really a very powerful act as far as um, rulemaking capabilities of agencies and then the legislature's oversight function as far as rulemaking. And one of the requirements is that each um, department in each agency is required to submit to to the um, committee of the legislature that has jurisdiction over that agency, what's called a regulatory agenda. And that's a list of all the rules that the agency expects to propose or amend in the coming year. And you are all then given the authority and in fact directed to review those regulatory agenda at a meeting called for that purpose. And this is that meeting, we listed it on the schedule. So you are technically reviewing the regulatory agenda. If we were in person, you would have a huge stack of paper that I would hand to you, which would have all of the regulatory agenda printed out on it. Because I couldn't do that for you, I thought 
Um, I would link you directly to the regulatory agenda. So if you click on any of these below, you will be brought to the posted regulatory agenda that are posted by the Secretary of State's website. And you can see that, for example, the Department of Administrative and Financial Services has on the 17 page document listed all of the rules that expects to amend or um, enact or propose for enactment this year. And I gave you, because a lot of the departments you oversee have many, many different um, sub agencies and you don't oversee all of them. So for example, in that 17 page document from DAFs, you only need to really focus on the Office of Marijuana Policy, which is our pages 14 to 15, and then BABLO, which is our on pages eight to 12. So basically at your leisure, when you have a moment, pull this, um, memo up online so then you can use all of the hyperlinks and then you can link through and see if you're curious to see what types of rules the agency intends to propose this year and if you have any questions about them you can direct them through me or you can go straight to the department liaison whichever one um, makes more sense for you and it just gives you an idea of what the agency is expecting to do as far as rulemaking goes so that you can stay abreast of the things that are going on this regulatory agenda doesn't replace the fact that you should get in your email inbox periodically those emails that state that at this moment, the agency is proposing an amendment to a rule and then you get that snapshot in time of something happening right now. Instead, the regulatory agenda is more of a broad, like years, years long, long range view. The agency is not prohibited from um, changing any rules that it doesn't list in its regulatory agenda. It's not that sort of a requirement. It's just supposed to be providing information to you so you have an idea. But if you pass a law that says you have to change the rules, they're still allowed to do that. And they will go ahead and give you notice when they do go forward with that. I think that's all I had to say today, other than it's nice to see you all again. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Janet. Um, that's really helpful just to give us an idea of the scope of what we have before us. As Janice said, we don't have a ton of bills yet. So, um, and we're not anticipating a ton, so it may not be a heavy bill load, but we do have a number of reports that we're gonna have um, to do. Although we don't always do the annual reports um, with a personal presentation because they're a lot of times just a financial disclosure stuff. Um, and like last session, we're Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so same days as always, and we'll try to um, stick to Monday and Wednesdays at the beginning as much as we can. Um, if there's holidays, we may have to pick up like a Tuesday or Thursday or something. Uh, Chairman Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to state for the record that I was laughing, but you couldn't hear me because I was muted. And I very much appreciate the use of the word purloined, which I have now confiscated and will add to my lexicon because I did not know what that meant and had to go and look it up. And it is a brilliant word. So I not only was I listening, but I learned something new today. So as always, Janet, thank you very much for that very, very thoughtful and meaningful presentation. I also Googled that too. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to feel like you all think I'm a nerd because I've only been accused of that my whole life. Um, I did want to say one other thing, that really long Title 28A bill, over 100 pages, I don't take responsibility for it, I'm sorry it's so long, but um, if you would like, um, we have binders and we have the capability to give you the title in a binder, we would put the bill in the binder because Karen has a copy of the bill already printed out for all of you. And we could have that ready for you to pick up the next time you come in to town, which I think is on the 26th. Um, so I don't know when the first work session will be, hopefully now that I've said that after that date. So then you could have that right in front of you. Um, I don't know, that's a lot to print. I absolutely do not mind. Our office does not mind. Karen does not mind. We've already organized it, made it possible. But if you really strongly object and you don't want um, the paper used for that, you could tell us, you, the bill has already been printed for you though. So um, we thought that might be helpful for you. Um, if you want to email me and yell at me over email, that's fine. I just wanted to let you know so that when you are in town again, after we send out the email saying they're ready, you'll know to stop by and get it from Karen. All right, thank you, Janet. Um, any other questions? I think we're pretty much done with everything for today. 
All right. Seeing none, our next uh, committee meeting is uh, scheduled for Wednesday at nine. Uh, more public hearings on the bills that we do have. So, All right. If there's nothing else, uh, we'll uh, adjourn the meeting. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. See ya. Thanks, folks.